So we also observed that, um, uh, you know, whilst the border fence had serious challenges, but in Guazulu Natal, uh, eight kilometers of it, uh, there is what is known as a Jersey barrier. Uh, that was, um, you know, uh, put in place is a concrete uh, stuff uh, meant to, you know, prevent, um, you know, uh, uh, those who steal our cars, um, <clears throat> our vehicles from crossing them over uh, into uh, these uh, countries. Uh, lastly, um, it's, it's called, uh, what you call it's 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 Lesotho. I'm not Lesotho. Uh, Eswazin, where uh, uh, that was a big uh, it, where it was a big problem, and and Mozambique as as, as well. So we visited uh, the areas, the three areas we visited. It's Bait Bridge, uh, border area, just a border and uh, areas al along. The, the border, uh, Gomadi port, uh, border area, and the uh, Kosi Bay uh, border area. So now we've invited the the <clears throat> the, the, the trekker and um, and Nesta. We thought we would invite uh, the insurance uh, industry as well, um, just to talk to us about their own experience. Uh, when it comes to the issue of, uh, you know, vehicles being uh, <clears throat> crossed, uh, illegally crossed over into another country. And uh, the soldiers on the ground, they told us the vehicles that are popular amongst uh, the car thieves, and, uh, and that if you drive that vehicle and you happen to be in that zone, uh, then you are likely to have your car uh, taken away. Um, and, and two, in some areas, very close to, to where this is very rife, they even visit um, people um, uh, at homes, take the keys at gunpoint and drive the car away. So, and that if, and, and we, are, we, are, we are told that these people are so brazen that they can kill people who stand you know, on, 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 in, in their way, who stand on their way uh, to smuggling uh, their vehicles across to, to another country. Uh, that uh, it forced the SNTF, you know, to, it's before this Jay-Z Bearer thing, to use boulders. Uh, to, to put borders where they cross these vehicles uh, over to stop uh, these uh, thieves uh, to, you know, take the, their cars, um, you know, across the, 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 the board. So that's a situation that, um, that's a conversation we wanted to have with, the, with the, uh, the, these two companies. Maybe they can uh, share with us some experiences, and but I'm interested in knowing uh, if they see this Jersey barrier thing effective, and if it is effective, whether they would recommend that it be extended to other parts of the country, and if they think uh, if if that if the answer to that um, is yes whether they would be prepared uh, to uh, make a contribution um, so that we, we don't have to wait for fiscals. The fiscals is in a serious uh, crisis when already uh, the house is under fire. They, maybe they can do something and say, look, and uh, it's in their interest as well that they come to the party and solve the thing. I thought colleagues, I should uh, just um, uh, in introducing, especially the issue. And uh, whilst waiting for the colleagues, I think we, 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 we now do have the numbers. But the good thing is that when we took the visits to these uh, um, 
you know, uh, borderline, uh, what you call this uh, borderline, uh, landline uh, border areas. Uh, the current uh, CJ Ops was deputy at the time and with, was with us uh, right through. For, and, and the good thing now is that when we discussed it concretely and with a view of making firm a resolution, is now in charge. Uh, you know, it's now the chief uh, of joint uh, operations. I'm saying this in welcoming all of you. I welcome you, uh, uh, CJ Ops, uh, General Sangweni, and 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 your team. Uh, good after, good evening. Good evening, Chair, and and uh, all the members um, of the Joint Standing Committee, as as well as your co-chair. Uh, Thank you so much. You. Yes, we we are available. Uh, Thank, you so much, Chief. Thank you so much, Chief. And then I don't know who is uh, here representing uh, uh, the representing Tracker and Esther. And uh, can I get uh, an indication? Uh, Secretary, do you know the the names? Um, <clears throat> even a chairperson from Tracker, I saw Mr. Tumangob. Um, uh, and then Mr. Tumangob. Two months ago, right? Yes, and then yeah. from from Netstar, I haven't seen anyone yet, unless they join in with a different name. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, good evening, co co chairperson and honourable members. Um, my name is Charles Morgan, and I represent Netstar. I unfortunately had to log in with a different computer due to technology issues. Is Charles who? Charles Morgan. Morgan. Right. Morgan, yes, that's correct. Uh, you, were, you, were, you were in the meeting when I was actually introducing the, the issue, isn't it? Absolutely. Thank you very much. I've been Thank in you the so meeting much the whole way. Um, Thank Mr. you. Mr. Morgan. Uh, Mr. Ngombo? I'm here present, uh, Mr. Chair. Okay. Right. No, thank you very much. So uh, I've introduced the issues. I will not come back um, uh, to the introduction. So we will then just launch into, into the presentation. And uh, once we are done with uh, the, the, the chief um, of joint operations. All right, colleagues, uh, uh, that, uh, be that as it may. And uh, all right, I think we are okay. Right. Let me now uh, invite, uh, I welcome all of you, uh, colleagues, thank you very much. Uh, I know you had a busy day today, you were in parliament, I was, those were there physically, some of us were doing it online. Right, with that, um, let's start the meeting, the item, uh, 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 Chief, uh, sorry, General uh, Sanguini. Uh, over to you, sir. How much time do you need from us? Can I give you uh, 20 minutes? Thank you, Chair. I, I will try to um, put speed. I think uh, if I put speed um, in 20 minutes, 25, uh, I okay. might uh, be finished. And uh, okay. I'll request that the presentation be run from your side, Chair, for some time. Okay. Um, committee Secretary, uh, is it possible? Can you do it from your side? Yes, Chair, I will. Please do. All right, this is the presentation. Um, is it possible to eliminate the slides preview on the left? All right, but um, the, the general can start. Um, all right, general, over to you. Thank you, chair, members um, of the committee. Um, as we have been uh, requested to present the overview of current uh, SNDF operations, uh, I'll request uh, for the purpose of saving time to Go straight to paragraph, no, to slide number five. 
So please move the slide, the slide. Matlokwana. Miss Matlokwana. Yes, Chair, I'm trying to move with Chair. Okay. Chair, what's, what's the name of the one is trying to move? Um, the, the structure of the presentation um, is that I will uh, first present um, the internal operations, and then secondly, it will be uh, external operations. And um, mainly, uh, all the in all in all the operations, I've tried to uh, have one uh, approach of, of of presenting it. Um, mainly, it will be the background or the situation, and then um, we will deal with a legal framework uh, that is um, directing or authorizing the operations, and then it will be some detail uh, in terms of uh, uh, concepts and, and um, just general information that is uh, important and or might be important to the members of the committee. Uh, starting with slide number five, internal operations. The first operation that um, I'm presenting is Operation Corona, which is border safeguarding. Uh, as you, when you uh, started with the meeting chair, you, you, you gave um, a very good um, background and, and actually the situation of, of uh, Buddha safeguarding uh, with its, its complexities and, and challenges. It is a very complex um, uh, operation and very challenging, but it is um, one of those operations that uh, we put all our efforts as the SNDF uh, to um, succeed. Uh, in terms of the background, um, here um, we are reflecting that uh, Operation Corona uh, is executed as part of the SNDF's mandate to defend the territorial integrity of uh, South Africa. A, a, a very important um, the issue of the mandate, meaning that the SNTF, there is no other way that uh, they can um, relinquish um, uh, this task because it is part of the mandate. And most importantly, to defend uh, the country. Uh, then uh, secondly, we are narrating that the era of operations of um, Operation Corona, um, it is the space from the borderline inland for 10 uh, kilometers. Now, when we speak about um, borderline, we speak about international borderline. I want to start from the beginning to uh, clearly uh, um, separate. When we speak about border, it is very holistic. It means uh, the borderline, and then it means the port of entry. Uh, as is the SNTF Operation Corona, we are deployed and are responsible for the borderline, which is from a particular port of entry to the next port of entry, meaning in between, uh, there is no operation corona in uh, at the port of entry. And also, we want to bring to attention that with with this um, legal framework of ten kilometers, uh, it also have got or it, it it creates an impediment, uh, what we call um, legislative uh, impediments. Because then it is required that we only do our patrols and our work within the 10 kilometers. The question would be what happens when there is criminal, cross border criminality just outside of the 10 kilometers? Two, how do you measure 10 kilometers uh, 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 on the ground 100% correctly? Uh, those are the challenges and complexities. And then we, we, we then took an approach that there are quite a number of uh, villages. Uh, community areas, uh, towns um, close to the borderline. 
some of them within the 10 kilometers, some are outside of the 10 kilometers. So we made that an extended area of operations um, of um, water safeguarding because those areas uh, have an influence on cross-border uh, criminality, have an effect and or are affected by uh, illegal cross-border uh, move, uh, movements uh, of personnel or vehicles. As you indicated, there are areas uh, like in KZN where the, almost the entire area of Mshabia Lingana gets affected by stealing of vehicles, even at gunpoint and hijacking for vehicles that has to go across. So those areas are outside of the 10 kilometers, then it cannot be that we leave them out and, and, and not. So an extended border um, area is, is, is all those um, areas. Um, and next slide. Yeah, the, the legal framework, uh, the legal framework um, uh, for border safeguarding uh, is that we deploy in terms of the Defense Act uh, 42 of 2002, Section 18, uh, Subsection 1, and uh, whereby uh, the president or the minister of defense and military veteran is uh, mandated to authorize the deployment uh, for this of the SNDF for this operation. And we are saying we always uh, comply to the legal, uh, uh, pro to the provisions of the legal framework. Now, in terms of the concept of operation uh, for border safeguarding, we have uh, currently, we, we are deployed in the seven provinces that have uh, international borders. The exception, it is Gauteng, uh, and the Western Cape. Western Cape has international borders, but it is maritime borders. The seven that have um, international land border line. And um, we are also saying Operation Corona is a standing obligation. As you will see, it is highlighted, it is bolded and underlined. And uh, force elements are deployed for a continuous period of six months, which thereafter they get um, uh, rotated. Standing obligation, very important uh, to members of the committee. Um, we cannot at any time uh, say it cannot be done or it will not be done. It is a standing obligation for the security and protection of the country. Next slide. In the next slide, we just... Uh, we're just presenting the map uh, of the first disposition uh, indicating um, the provinces and specifically the areas where the HQs of the, of the deployed elements are. And you'll see also there the size of the um, uh, force levels or units that are deployed in, in those different areas. Next slide. Now, very importantly, we want to share with the committee the objectives of Operation Corona, uh, which is to prevent the illegal cross-border movements of persons, contraband, livestock, weapons, drugs, and vehicles across our international borderline. Uh, one of the ob other objectives is to apprehend undocumented persons, criminals, illegal livestock, weapons, drugs, contraband, and stolen vehicles. And thirdly, to create a deterrence to any possible threat of foreign aggression across our international borders. We prevent by deploying, uh, conducting our patrols, then one of the objective is to prevent the criminals uh, and all uh, undocumented persons should be prevented and should not even attempt to come uh, across um, uh, the borderline illegally, they must go through the formal port of entry. So this is what we call dominate um, the area for prevention. Secondly, if any of those um, uh, criminal uh, elements or, and, or undocumented persons attempt to cross and they, were they are found crossing, we then do the apprehension. We apprehend them, detain them, and take them 
and hand them over to the SAPS uh, for further um, uh, prosecution, inclusive of uh, the illegal livestock that uh, gets um, pushed across, uh, either stolen or for illegal grazing, and also drugs, contraband, and stolen vehicles. Then we do the apprehension. Uh, but thirdly, the deterrence um, issue to any possible aggression. If there was no military presence in the borderline, um, any other foreign aggression can then uh, find space to uh, try and do something uh, into the country. So by mere presence, then you create a deterrence. I want to also share that um, that provides uh, a semblance of uh, a defense uh, of the territorial in in integrity at a low level. If at any time there is a possibility um, of uh, foreign aggression, then those soldiers deployed there for border safeguarding, then they become the first line of defense for a conventional um, threat. So um, that's why we're saying a deterrence to any foreign aggression. Uh, this, uh, that's all that I, 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 we are presenting for Operation Corona. Uh, the next operation is Operation Chariot, which um, is humanitarian assistance and disaster management and relief. And um, in terms of background information, we are saying the SNTF deploys to provide support and assistance to other government departments on request. And the deployment will be initiated by a request from uh, the minister of a particular government department to the DOD for the provision of those um, that required support or assistance um, utilizing our capabilities and or expertise. And the legal framework is the same as Corona Defense Act. And uh, the Minister of Defense um, and military veterans is mandated to authorize the deployment. Proceed. Just to bring you on uh, board the recent operations under Operation Chariot, um, we are bringing to you the Operation Vimba, um, which is a DOT code name for the SEMS South African Military Health Services Operation that we conducted in support, um, providing support to the Gauteng Department of Health for the fight against COVID-19, uh, whereby the Minister of Health submitted a request to the DOD uh, for support and assistance to, for us to provide military healthcare services uh, to the hospitals um, in Gauteng. Initially, it was two hospitals, and then it was narrowed down to one hospital which is uh, Chris Ani Baragona Hospital. At that time, um, it was seriously overwhelmed and overburdened uh, uh, during uh, the fight against uh, COVID-19 uh, early this year, uh, from July uh, till September. And we are saying we did that uh, very successfully and was completed by the 30th of September, 2021. Uh, furthermore, uh, other examples is the seasonal disaster response that we, we uh, get involved in. And it has become a norm that during rainy and dry season, and sometimes winter season, uh, the, our assistant is required um, and requested by various uh, uh, government departments provide uh, necessary support or assistance to respond to natural disasters. Um, examples will be the firefighting that we yearly uh, are involved in supporting uh, on Ten Mountain. We fed fires at uh, several national parks. And when there are uh, floods, uh, we also get uh, requested and required to provide support and assistance. and. Um, Previous years, they used to be uh, frequent during winter. That on the entry or at Van Rennens Park, Van Rennens Pass, uh, there'll be snow where the road will be blocked, and then we'll be required to assist 
um, with our vehicles to pull uh, stuck vehicles there and also to clear um, the snow. And the most recent one, um, we, we deployed um, Oryx helicopters to fight uh, the runaway, runaway fed fires in the Northern Cape. And also currently we are conducting vaccine distribution that is also conducted as part of Operation Chariot or under Operation Chariot, where we are supporting the National Department of Health um, on an ongoing basis to distribute vaccine uh, countrywide uh, to the provinces or within the provinces to the required centers. And we're utilizing um, Air Force uh, fixed wing aircrafts. Proceed. Yes, uh, all about Operation Chariot. Then the next operation is Operation Arabella, which is a maritime and aeronautical search and rescue operation. And the uh, background information, we are saying um, the RSA is a signatory to various international agreements and um, protocols, amongst others, uh, the SNTF has an obligation, meaning amongst other departments, the SNTF has an obligation to conduct search and rescue operations um, when required. Importantly, that this is an obligation uh, because the government of uh, the Republic of South Africa has um, assigned the agreements and protocols to provide um, search and rescue when uh, it is required and also uh, guided by the National Disaster, Disaster Management Act, uh, when there is a need for a requirement for, or a situation uh, where human life is at stake, it is a must that the SNTF uh, with its capabilities or expertise must respond and provide immediate um, relief uh, for the first 72 hours, period of 72 hours. Thereafter, uh, if it's uh, the response is uh, above 72 hours, then the necessary authorities and approvals by um, the minister uh, will have to be undertaken. But importantly, there is where we cannot say no. When there are vessels at, um, uh, in distress at sea, when there's an aircraft that might have um, crashed uh, somewhere where there are people who have been lost or fallen, uh, during uh, the hiking trails, uh, we are obligated and must uh, respond. As long as there's where we have been uh, requested, um, then we are bound uh, to respond. The legal framework um, governing uh, Operation Arabella is again the Defense Act uh, of 2002. Here, the slight difference is that we will are expected and mandated to deploy even before the authorization of the deployment, if it's within the 72 hours period where is life um, at, at stake. The concept of Operation Arabella is that we have to uh, place on standby uh, capabilities, mainly in the air and maritime environment, to respond to uh, situations or requests um, in this regard. And, and mainly we request, we receive requests from government departments, uh, government agencies, institutions, foreign vessels or aircraft, as well as private emergency response companies and private persons. The, emergency, the private emergency response companies, when they see that they do not have that capability, then they place the request to uh, the SNTF in any other private person, if um, is found to be in, in a situation where it needs capabilities that are in the SNTF, then when you are requested and it is a life-saving situation, then we are obliged or obligated to uh, respond as long as it's within the 72 hours. Um, Chair, that's uh, all about Operation Arabella. The other operation in terms of internal operation is Operation Prosper, which is defined as cooperation 
with the uh, SAPS. And the background information, we are saying that the SNTF deploys for service in cooperation with the SAPS to provide support and assistance in maintaining law and order, as well as provide safety and security for the people of uh, South Africa. The deployment gets initiated by a request from the Minister of Police in situations where the SAPS is overwhelmed and is struggling to address that particular situ situation. Uh, we do not uh, ourselves decide that we have to go and assist and support the police or we must uh, work in cooperation with the police. Uh, there must be a situation. And the SAPS also um, do not and must not or should not then um, request us just for normal uh, policing uh, work. They've got the mandate and duty to do their work. And only when really they are overwhelmed by the situation and they are struggling, then they request additional support and assistance from the uh, SNTF. And what we do, um, we then maintain a standby capability of one subunit in each province as a contingency to respond to uh, for this requirement. This is coming out from uh, experiences that it often happens that there will be an area where really the police have been uh, stretched to the limit and then they need support and then we are we get requested and then we go and support the police. The legal framework governing uh, Operation Prosper um, is uh, different to the other operations that uh, we have presented. Was this one? Uh, it is uh, governed uh, in terms of section section two o one two subsection a of the constitution, and read with the section nineteen of the Defence Act. And therefore, you will see that only the president is mandated to authorize the deployment of the SNDF for this operation, and uh, not the minister. But we are saying and confirming to the committee that the SNTF, we always comply to the provisions um, of this uh, legal framework. Uh, in terms of recent deployments uh, under Operation Prosper, uh, just to recall your memory, it was the July 2021 unrest, as well as the local government um, elections. The committee, I, I, I uh, do know that you, uh, in agreement with us that we followed the legal framework uh, accordingly for authorization or for the military to deploy uh, for these two recent deployments under Operation Prosper. Uh, Chair and members of the committee, um, that is uh, all about the five uh, different types of operation in, in, in internal operations. Now, uh, going to external operations, uh, we have Operation Mistral, which is a UN stabilization mission in the Democratic Republic of the Congo uh, with an acronym of MONUSCO. The background information is that the SNTF deploys and conducts operations outside the country in accordance with its international obligations mandate to contribute towards the attainment of security peace and stability in the region, the continent and internationally. Um, it is a mandate and it is an obligation uh, for the country, uh, which is then uh, satisfied through um, the deployment of uh, the SNTF. Um, we are saying that uh, we have post elements deployed currently under the United, under MONUSCO uh, in the DRC, and that deployment uh, is conducted for a continuous period of 12 months. A force element will deploy for a period of 12 months, and thereafter they get um, rotated. And, and the code name for this uh, in on the SNTF, it is called OPMISTRAL, whereas as UN, it is MONUSCO. The legal framework for this um, conducting of uh, of Mistral and all other external deployments um, 
is we deploy in terms of the constitution, uh, section 201, subsection 2, subsection C, whereby the president is the only one who's mandated to authorize the deployment uh, for this um, operation. And the legal provisions, we do comply to those um, legal requirements. Um, the force elements uh, currently uh, in deployed for Opmistral, we have um, a force intervention brigade, which we call the FIB. We have tactical intelligence unit uh, called the TIU. We also have composite helicopter unit, the CHU, as well as um, SNDF specialized contingent, the sand of spec. Um, also, we are busy preparing um, for the deployment of, the, of a quick reaction force um, company, which is called the QRF, which is an addition, which would be an additional element that is earmarked to deploy to MONUSCO uh, in January 22 or February 22. Um, the issue of the QRF came about when you started the air road down strategy and reconfiguring um, MONUSCO operations where there was a need for a quick reaction force elements. And, and during that in configuration, the FIB and Sanderspec were reduced and um, uh, but co complemented uh, with quick reaction force elements. There will be four. Uh, the RSA we are deploying is craft F number four. The other two is, uh, the other three is Malawi, Nepal, and Kenya. They are coming from uh, Malawi, Kenya, and Nepal. At the next slide, we're just um, showing the first disposition of uh, MONUSCO post elements, our uh, RSA uh, MONUSCO elements, which are deployed in the North, North Kivu, but the entire MONUSCO effort is uh, focused uh, currently in uh, uh, North Kivu of the DRC. The next slide is a um, much clearer um, map for the North Kivu province, whereby you will see uh, that we are indicating that the uh, composite helicopter unit, uh, CHU, is uh, stationed in Goma. Uh, and then the FIB effort is um, stationed or deployed in the Beni uh, ter territory. The current situation with Op Mistral is that um, the RSA battalion uh, in the FIP, the FIP uh, has got three battalions. As a brigade, it's got three battalions, one from RSA, one from Malawi, one from Tanzania. So currently the RSA battalion, uh, we are conducting the yearly rotation of the units whereby 15 side is returning back is, and is being relieved by uh, two one side battalion. 15 side from uh, Limpombo to one side from uh, Johannesburg Kauding. And then the yearly rotation of the CHU and Sandersberg um, post elements is scheduled for January, February 2022. Um, that's all uh, in respect of uh, Operation Mistral Chair and members of the committee. Um, the other operation in, in, in external operations is Operation Vikela, which is the SADAC mission in Mozambique, uh, Samim. The background info uh, is, uh, for your indulgence members, is that over the past few years, SADAC has been seized with discussions at various levels to find a solution to the warring security situation in Mozambique. Uh, the situation is brought about the terrorist group Al Sunawa Jama is WJ that has been perpetrating acts of terrorism and violent extremism in the northeastern parts of the country of Mozambique, particularly Cabo Delgado province, since 2017. Thereby, the second extraordinary summit of heads of state and governments that was held in Maputo on the 23rd of June approved a decision for a regional response and assistance to the Republic of Mozambique involving the deployment of a SADAC standby force mission to Mozambique, which is then called SAMIM. 
the legal framework governing uh, Operation Vikela uh, is the same as that of uh, Operation Mistral, which is the Constitution Section 201, and thereby uh, has to be authorized by the President. The structure of the SADAC response, uh, for your knowledge, um, is it conducted um, by means of initially deployment of scenario six of the African Union Peace Support Operations Framework, whereby that is a military-led intervention, uh, scenario six, where we deploy a rapid deployment capability for an initial period of three months um, basically, this is where we are currently. Uh, scenario six, rapid deployment capability, uh, uh, small elements uh, to assist uh, in gathering information of the uh, situation and also do some fixing where uh, it is necessary. Uh, the current deployment of um, the three months was then extended. Um, uh, by the uh, summit, we are now currently on the second uh, period of extended period of three months. But in terms of the structure, after scenario six has achieved the set objectives or the required objectives, um, then uh, it then necessitates a possible follow up deployment under scenario five, uh, also of the AUPSO. Uh, whereby then that deployment uh, becomes a peacekeeping, uh, full peacekeeping type of um, deployment, a multidimensional force. When we say multidimensional force, it is then no more only military-led. Uh, now, when it comes to peacekeeping, uh, the civilian component normally takes the leadership uh, of, the, of the mission, and then the military is in support, it deals with security issues and deals with protection of um, those uh, peacekeeping elements, the it humanitarian uh, actors, uh, the it economic actors, and a uh, protection of civilians, uh, escorting, and all of that. Uh, that will be scenario five. Um, then, according to the structure, one of the requirements for the site response was to was included assistance, a requirement to assist uh, Mozambique with local support and training of the Mozambique security establishment. Next slide. The impact of uh, Operation Vikela in Samim. Operation Vikela is a code name for the SNDF uh, effort in, in, in Samim uh, for, to make it clear. The impact of um, Samim, we are saying Samim forces have achieved huge strides and made a positive difference in the security situation uh, in the northern parts of Mozambique. The deployment has brought a certain degree of normalcy in the affected areas, and it is seen uh, by a number of internal dis displaced persons which have started returning back to their homes or areas of uh, residence. Additionally, terrorist units have been dislodged from their bases and their strongholds in Mosimba, Tapraya, and Palma are now under the control of government forces. Mosimba, Tapraya, and Palma are um, in Calvo Delgado, and you will recall that at this stage, Palma was seized and was under the control of the terrorists. Now they have been dislodged and um, chased away from their strongholds. Those two areas are now under government control, the government of Mozambique. Uh, I'm saying here, yeah, the members of the committee, as part of SAMIM, the SNDF force elements have been in the forefront and have taken a lead in the conduct of um, these successful offensive uh, operations. Um, in Samim, uh, deployed elements uh, or no uh, uh, countries, it is RSC, it is Botswana, uh, it is Lesotho, it is Tanzania, uh, it is uh, Angola, um, 
also in uh, in terms of uh, staff officers uh, Zambia uh, I hope I did not leave any um, member state out of this one then chair the last operation in terms of external operations is operation Copa which is SADAC anti-piracy and maritime security operation in the Mozambique channel. The background information, information is that SADAC um, uh, Copa is a SADAC maritime security strategy, which was formally adopted by the summit of heads of state and governments, which was held in Rwanda uh, in August 2021. Uh, out of that, that decision, it led to a tripartite memorandum of understanding between the RSA, Tanzania, and Mozambique government for maritime deployments in the Indian Ocean have the increasing threat of piracy in the Mozambique channel. The concept of Operation Copper, uh, under the concept, uh, the main objective of the operation is to promote maritime security in the region. That's what the uh, maritime security strategy uh, of SADAC uh, indicate, to promote maritime security uh, in the region by means of conducting regular pat maritime patrols in the Mozambique channel. The legal framework uh, governing uh, operation Copper is the same as other those which uh, for external operation. Now, Chair, I want to bring to your attention and the members of the committee that Operation Copper, currently, as we have seen in our quarterly reports, uh, is that Operation Copper uh, currently on an operational pause uh, due to uh, the deployment of the SA Navy assets or vessels to Operation Vigela. Uh, that is the reason that uh, we conducted an operational course for Operation uh, Copper. Uh, secondly, the capacity challenges and shortcomings that are experienced um, by the SA Navy uh, also required us to conduct an operational course. Operational course is a military term for the purpose of um, Reorganizing and 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 replanning and re preparation uh, in an operation or during an advance to conduct or during conduct. When you see that you are struggling and all will struggle, you have to take an operational pause and plan accordingly, and then uh, commence. However, of importance is that um, some of the op the the, the what is bringing in some comfort to us is that some of the operation objectives of Operation Copper are encompassed and achieved through the deployment in Operation Vigela. In Operation Vigela, our vessels moved from the RSA through the Mozambique Channel to the Mozambican waters and are deployed there. Then the objectives of Copper then get uh, achieved. Uh, that's all um, I felt is necessary to present to you, Chair, and the members of the committee. I thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, General, uh, <clears throat> for the presentation. Um, uh, you know, um, well presented, and uh, you know, and giving us the factual uh, situation. Uh, in simple in simple terms we thank you and we thank your team uh, general maybe le let's let's have may, may i ask you to have a, uh, to pause a bit and and then invite the team from the the tracker and and nesta uh, to come and do the, their presentation as well and uh, they'll recall that in my opening remarks i mentioned that um, uh, we came across a situation where a cars have been smuggled uh, across to, uh, to to Mozambique, uh, Swaziland, and um, 
uh, etc. And in, in that, um, in case then they even installed the the, the jersey bearer to try and uh, slow down um, the smuggling of the vehicles. And, um, and and the story was that once your car is on the other side, uh, uh, in, 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 in most chances, you're not going to get it. Uh, if you get it, uh, the fellows will make you to pay um, pay them to release the car. Um, but the other part was, you know, cooperation between um, you know the law enforcement uh, agencies on that side, and um, and the law enforcement agencies this side uh, of the border. That was not so good to enable um, quick recovery of, of the vehicles. We have statistics and the amounts, uh, the, the numbers of cars that um, were recovered, uh, stolen and recovered, and, um, and, and cars that um, were impounded, um, the, the amounts are there. The amounts we don't have are the cars that uh, were not reported uh, uh, anyway because um, they were successfully smuggled on the other side. So that's the situation. Now, having uh, said that, and um, and you have heard uh, me making an introduction, may I then invite you, and uh, Mr. Ngobo, I will start with you from Treka. Uh, 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 and then I will move to uh, Morgan uh, from Nesta. Uh, good evening. I just want to firstly check my audio, uh, if I'm perfectly audible. Yes, you are audible and we can see your presentation on the screen. A hundred percent. Um, thank you very much, Chairperson, for obviously the opportunity. Um, and we'd like to thank the rest of the members of the um, uh, committee uh, for the opportunity to obviously share uh, our insights. Um, I won't go through all the elements of the presentation, Chair, because I think um, in your introduction, you gave quite a composite view of um, the key elements in terms of vehicle crime, particularly with a specific focus on cross-border uh, movement. What I thought I would do uh, for the benefit of the audience, if you can just please uh, flick to slide two, is I'll give a basic overview of our position as tracker. Uh, I'll give some insights in terms of operational overview as we see it. So in other words, how do vehicle eventually uh, arrive at the border. Uh, I think some of the elements, Chair, you touched on around the border towns and surrounds, but there's a lot of movements that happens prior to that that I think is of relevance uh, for this committee's consumption. Uh, I'll also talk about, you know, some known uh, modus operandi, uh, whether it's concealment or whether it's direct uh, sort of driving of said vehicles across the border. Then I'll give some commentary uh, although not exclusively, in terms of how we see, um, you know, the sort of confluence between physical structures and the use of technology. Uh, I think you touched uh, in the KZN area, for example, uh, whether, you know, the, the physical structures do act as an impediment. And we've got some views uh, in terms of that. So if you can quickly flick, please uh, flick to the next slide. I think our key takeaway without going through the entire writer is that our brand promise is to care to protect. And as Tracker, we really, really believe in that promise um, in that our objective is far more noble or far more objective than just the retrieval of stolen vehicle. Um, our purpose is to care and protect for people and their things. And we believe we do this by influencing uh, better drivers, uh, safer drivers, uh, and uh, collaborating with a variety of entities uh, to prevent vehicle theft and hijackings, 
and to provide a, a safe and convenient way for South Africans to live their lives. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I think it must be important to note that from a tracker point of view, we, we have a highly differentiated approach in terms of our relationship. So we work with the South African police, um, and that's a relationship um, that has lasted uh, for over 24 years. It's quite a close relationship that we quite pride of uh, under the leadership of South African police. We also work with a variety of law enforcement agencies, whether it's the Insurance Crime Bureau, whether it's private security, and various other role players, uh, organization like IATI, uh, who are form a key part of tackling vehicle crime. I think what must also be noted is that uh, Tracker has quite a strong presence on the ground, uh, what we so-called our law enforcement liaison officers. These are members from Tracker who have a vast experience, um, whether from police or from other backgrounds that really understand the lay of the land and really have quite a, a good insight in terms of identifying stolen vehicles, identifying uh, vehicles that have subsequently been masked and the movement of vehicles across the border. I've touched on the, uh, the, our public-private partnership uh, with the South African police, but I'd like to call out that we are constantly seeking to explore other opportunities because we see it as quite a fungible relationship in the sense that what is of value to us when we partner with other role players makes sense in terms of trying to tackle vehicle crime. In our view, um, this acts as a force multiplier in bolstering the recovery infrastructure and the footprint in terms of vehicle recovery. We also believe that it's not only forces on the ground, but aerial support really plays a meaningful role um, in, in terms of vehicle recovery and the success therein. I think access to information and information sharing with other role players is another key part that I'd like to call out. So over the years, just to give a view, we've engaged with over 16,000 uh, uh, trained officers um, to try and share our technology capability, to try and share our know-how insofar as vehicle crime. And this extends to various other, uh, other uh, areas of vehicle crime. In South Africa, I think it's, it's common cause that where you have a firearm and you have a vehicle, those are important tools in the commission of any kind of crime. So there's kind of this vicious circle, or cycle rather, in terms of uh, uh, our, our interest in tackling the scourge of crime. Uh, Tracker also is quite proud of our investig uh, investigative capability in terms of understanding crime insights and the trends therein. I, I think the General Sangweni in the beginning touched on the ports of entry, because that's a very, very uh, important aspect to understand where the opportunities for crime do occur. So over the years, I won't go into too much detail around the arrests that we have partnered with uh, our law enforcement to obviously effect. But the key takeaway here is that this multidisciplinary approach is a key uh, tool in terms of how we tackle crime. We also like a key takeaway that intelligence-driven disruptive operations is a way of tackling cross-border crime. And this intelligence-driven uh, disruptive operations, I think you've touched on some of the common themes. Theme one is the, 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 the uh, disbursement of the legal regimes between us and different countries, us being South Africa, as well as our neighboring countries, and the management of the laws there, which then makes it quite difficult to recover the vehicle from uh, our neighboring countries once a vehicle has gone across the border. So these intelligence-driven operations help disrupt the chassis of, of vehicle crime. I also think that we must mention that uh, part of what we've, been, uh, uh, we've identified as a success, a success factor is the collaboration of South African police together with the SNDF and various other industry bodies. I'm keenly appreciative of what the general highlighted in terms of the, the territorial nature of the different forces. So in other words, from the border up to 10 kilometers inland. 
So the topography on the ground makes it quite challenging to say where does that 10 kilometer radius start and end. And also the interpretation of, of whose uh, role and responsibility it is at different points. And I'll circle back later in the presentation with some thoughts and reflections on that. Next slide, please. So just maybe to, to go into some insights, uh, what we see from, from our car park is that certainly border safeguarding is a logical extension uh, of, of, of defense and, the, and protecting the territorial integrity of South Africa. And as a consequence, this includes stolen vehicle or hijacked vehicles. And pointedly, the scourge of hijacked vehicles is on the increase. Um, and, you know, if you're interested, I could share additional data there. Uh, we do believe in four structures that are tailored towards the combating of crime. So be it a type of fencing, be it a, a type of physical structure to try and prevent crime. But of course, we know criminals uh, are highly industrious at times, and they, they do find ways and means of putting ramps over physical structures and various other capabilities that creatively they're able to, 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 to design. And that then renders physical structures only partially uh, successful. There's a role to play for physical structures as part of the impediment infrastructure, but we believe there's other kind of capability which can complement those physical structures. So ultimately, the cooperative approach and coordination with SANDF, uh, as well as other industry bodies, together with companies like Tracker and others, uh, who are collegial to us, like our, our, our colleagues on the call, we believe is an imperative that, that can help us do this. So just on the next slide, um, I, what I wanted to capture on this slide is there's various uh, elements towards uh, criminals partake in either transferring vehicles. So on one of the images there, you will see a vehicle uh, that they sought to mask by covering up the vehicle as though they were ferrying goods, uh, vegetables and, and the like across the border. But equally, you find uh, vehicles that they attempt to, to dredge across rivers. So either use another vehicle to push that vehicle across or use live animals, donkeys, etc., to pull the vehicle across the river. And one may ask why uh, 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 run the risk of submerging a vehicle into water, it would render that vehicle un, uh, uh, um, uh, difficult to drive thereafter. We must understand that the purpose therein may be for the use of parts uh, in a foreign country, so it becomes part of the secondhand car parts distribution. It may be to repair a vehicle, or the damage might be quite limited depending on different seasons where the water levels then, then, then are, are far lower. So this is important to understand. And just to look on the far right-hand side, uh, I know it's a very busy slide with seemingly a lot of squigglies. What we are interpreting there is that the movement of vehicle does not always start and end uh, at the border. I noted, Chair, that you highlighted KZN uh, ala the Cozy Bay area, for example, where uh, different parties may effectively raid from uh, our, our neighboring countries into KwaZulu-Natal. And that certainly happens. Um, some of these syndicates are quite well armed and quite sophisticated where they've got spotters who identify the different vehicles that are targeted for this approach. So that certainly does happen. But we must recognize that it also happens that vehicles are transported, uh, particularly from uh, uh, areas like Gauteng, which is a major metro. And the transportation of vehicle really follows kind of your semigration pattern. So wherever there's a high economic activity, it predisposes to certain vehicles. Uh, and I'll share just now the make, the sort of look and feel of what type of vehicles. So we really see the movement of vehicles going across either into Swaziland, which you pointed out, Mozambique. Uh, I also had the benefit, Chair, of visiting the Komati port area. And, and, and you'd be surprised of the ingenious nature uh, sometimes that, that, that uh, criminals undertake. 
is really quite beguiling when you try and understand the methods they use, um, which is the, the first two pictures are only just a sample of, of some of the elements. Some of the vehicles you find hidden in quite thick bush um, uh, where the lights are off completely. But because the criminals understand the lay of the land, and because there's individuals who understand those territories quite well, they know exactly where they're going, even in the pitch of darkness. And I think the, the, the SANDF, as well as our police forces, do somewhat of a role in, in slowing down these activities. But I think in the absence of appropriate technology, uh, this becomes somewhat limited. Uh, next slide, please. Another important factor that I think is worth considering is the price parity of a normal vehicle between South Africa and, say, our neighboring countries. So um, this data was just to try and convert the currency. So if you take a vehicle that is circa 600,000 Rand in South African terms, and you were to convert it into, say, a Malawian quatches, you will find that the Rand equivalent uh, of that becomes about 1.2 million rand. So therefore, it creates a perverse appetite to come and get the vehicle in South Africa. That's one thing I think is important to understand. The second thing to understand is that uh, when it comes to vehicles, um, it may be a Toyota as we know it, or another type of vehicle. But in the neighboring countries, uh, for example, a Mozambique or a Malawi, it can have a different brand name or a different naming convention. So this was an example of a vehicle that was fully South African spec, was, but was up for sale in a secondhand market in Malawi. So in other words, this is typically a vehicle that came from South Africa and could not have been produced for that particular market. That again creates the necessary incentive to then uh, uh, get the vehicle and actually steal the vehicles or hijack the vehicles and take them across the border. Uh, next slide, please. So ultimately, what are we saying in terms of uh, the nub of what we were asked? I think that the main thing was, what is our, our view on border safeguarding? We really, really believe that a focused approach towards partnerships uh, under the leadership of the uh, and the direction of this committee um, is, is what is appropriate. Uh, this focused approach must have tailored structures uh, that specifically focus on combating vehicle crime. But as a consequence of that, it will make a meaningful contribution towards the curtailing of contraband and other human-centric uh, crimes, such as uh, 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 um, human trafficking and the like. We really believe a, cooper a cooperative approach, which thankfully the general highlighted in terms of uh, SAPS, SANDF, and other bodies that perhaps were not named on this specific call. Uh, we'd like to agree that complementing the existing physical infrastructure, but together with technology, and not just technology for technology's sake, I think appropriate technology that either helps us gather insights and data, in other words, monitoring movements, uh, understanding the types of movements, and geospatial type technology. So as you get closer to the proximity of the border, there may be other capabilities that can be leveraged there. Um, so once, if we accept this approach, it's important to, to acknowledge that uh, safeguarding the, 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 the sovereignty um, as a key priority is important and then to create almost a task team approach um, under specific structures is what is appropriate and to create an, an appropriate uh, reporting mechanism. I've already spoken on focused interventions. So we've been doing for a number of years, uh, training members of the South African police, either in identifying vehicle crime or using the latest technology. Um, there's a whole lot of technology that can enable uh, members of different uh, forces to identify the history of the vehicle. So in other words, if there's an active case where the vehicle may have been stolen. Um, have, have I lost him? Can you hear me now? 
Yes, yes, yes. So now we are back. Um, all right. So I'm not sure where I was, but let me just go back to the focused approach, Chair, if I may. I think you have gone, you have, you have completed right up to complementing existing structures with technology. A hundred percent. Yes. Uh, the point I was at now would be, we believe we can help train and mentor uh, different members of security forces, be it the SANDF, in, in being able to identify vehicle crime techniques, making them understand the patterns of vehicle crime techniques. And where this is important is because as the scourge of robberies and hijackings increase, it's important to understand that these individuals are well armed and in some inst in many instances quite sophisticated we can help support technical um, support in terms of transnational vehicle crime movements by sharing data and our our know-how we can also assist in some recovery and identify and identification and repatriation activities in some instances where vehicles are hijacked often they may be kidnapping, they may be hostage taking, which forms part of this process. And I think these patterns are important to share. There's also the sharing of vehicle crime intelligence together with the requisite authorities, be it SANDF. And then it's important from our perspective, some level of community engagement. Um, Chair, we don't have the full answers in terms of what this could look like, but we believe these are key themes that if we focus on them, we can figure out what level of engagement and with which communities. Uh, I think the communities around Swaziland may have certain nuanced uh, engagements that might be different to Komati Puerto, that might be different to KZN. I think you touched right in the beginning, Che, around the creation of the borders, that there's a lot of uh, uh, family ties, both in country as well as in our neighboring countries, where the engagement needs to be quite tailored uh, in, in, in that respect. I think I don't want to, to, to encroach um, on some of the elements that uh, General Sangweni touched on in terms of the, the existing interventions of SANDF, short of saying that we believe we can accelerate some of these interventions through these, this collaborative effort. Just touching on the technology a little bit, um, there's a lot of technology that is in the disposal of ourselves, and I'm sure our colleagues can touch on it as well, just from a, a respect of what kind of technology. So there's in-vehicle technology, but there's also external or extenuous technology that can be utilized in quite a tactical manner um, that can create kind of a herding process where a vehicle uh, is in and around the, the, the border area. And this can be unpacked once we create a, a proper sort of task team and governance structure. There's also the engagement around aerial capability. Now, I'm mindful that in the 10 kilometer zone where the ACNDF um, sort of has uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, a mandate, it's important to be, be mindful of what that aerial capability would look like. And we'd obviously need to engage the requisite bodies in terms of what that uh, technology could be. But there's things like the use of drones, both manned uh, and unmanned kind of aerial capability that can give really a good insight into the topography, into the movement of vehicles and so on. I've touched on a geospatial technology. There's also some level of satellite technology that can really, really be utilized. I think what I'm trying to say here is it's not a technology for technology's sake. It's really to, to have a data and insights-led approach. This is quite key because the physical infrastructures help impede, but the movement and the patterns of movement is what you want to get insight on. And where those patterns of movement start from. So in other words, um, the, the, the data that you have, Chair Ron, how many vehicles circa move across the border is an important starting point. The make and model is another important starting point, but there's also where they start from. In other words, where do they start from? How do they make their way to the border? 
And dare I say, it's not always about masking. There's also quite brazen, uh, uh, almost fleet style driving of vehicles towards the border so that if there's four vehicles and one or two are caught, at least the other two will make it across. It's still quite a profitable endeavor. So the data and the insights will lead us to kind of understanding those imperatives. Lastly, while having said this, that from a tracker point of view, our ethos is to make a safer, uh, a safer South Africa, safer drivers, and to give freedom and expression to that. Um, we'd like to suggest that if we created a central uh, command capability that gives mandate and breadth to monitoring the vehicle movements, to sharing insights in a controlled way, and to create a really uh, a, a robust governance structure, uh, either through an MOU type approach, uh, uh, the necessary NDAs for parties to collaborate in a meaningful way, and that the sharing of intellectual property is then well managed within this sort of task team approach. Uh, while I said our relationship is collegial, there is certain intellectual property that we would like to, to retain, but we would obviously be governed by whatever the agreements are. Um, I'd like to pause there, Chair, and take any questions. Um, and perhaps maybe what I should have done um, is I have two of my colleagues present with me. We don't, as a general rule, uh, in tracker support Zoom, but given the import of this conversation, we thought we would make a plan. So they're next to me, but they're not immediately visible to the camera. I may defer to them and introduce them before they answer, if, if, if you don't mind, Chair. No, it's fine. I don't mind. Um, would you mind uh, introducing them at least? Okay. If we cannot see their faces. I have Mr. Leon Botma. Uh, Mr. Leon Botma, uh, and I'm happy to type their details, if I may, um, uh, to type their details to share so that you have the right spelling and nomenclature. Uh, then I have Mr. Ivan Hayden, right? Uh, Mr. Leon Bortma is responsible in Tracker for operational response services. So that is actually the identification of, of, of vehicle crime, the recovery of vehicles, um, specifically for members of our car park. But we work quite collaboratively with our colleagues. So any vehicle that we find, we can obviously have a mechanism therein. Mr. Ivan Haydenreich is responsible for operational compliance and investigation. Uh, so those two ambits is any partner that we work with. So from a compliance point of view, in terms of uh, the vetting, the necessary MOUs, as well as the, in, the, the crime insights and investigation or the patterns of crime, he's really the insights engine or forms part of the insights engine at Tracker. All right. You you have not introduced yourself. Um... Uh, my name is Duman Gobo. I am the chief operating officer for Tracker. Thank you very much. I wanted to just to give us even your position within the company. Thank thank you very much, Duman um, uh, Gobo. Uh, even I, I I'm not too sure if they want to uh, add uh, anything. Um, May I invite them to do so if they so wish before we take the next presentation? They they say they're perfectly comfortable, Chair. Thank you for the oh, Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, All right. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, we've really uh, taken this uh, invitation seriously. Um, what you have shared with us would really certainly uh, you know, uh, help this committee uh, understand um, <clears throat> the issues um, even more. Uh, because so far we have been on the ground, we've listened to what the SA, we what the SNDF is is doing. We also know what the SAPS is also doing, and but we did not have this side of uh, uh, the information. Yeah, we, I agree we need this collaborative uh, approach. We can only achieve that if we know if the left hand knows what the right hand uh, 
uh, is doing. Right, be that as it may, let me uh, invite Nesta to do to make their own presentation as well. Over to Nesta, please introduce yourself. If you have people accompanying you, uh, and you don't mind introducing them, please introduce them. Right, thank you very much, uh, co, co chairperson and, and members. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, I'm Charles Morgan, I am the operations executive for NetStar. Um, which in short, the whole area of the tactical recovery side of the business falls under my due restriction. Um, I don't have a colleague or any other colleagues that have joined me on this call, so I'm alone at this stage. Um, would you like me to share the presentation or would you do so on your side? Yes, please. Uh, I don't know. Uh, what do you prefer, um, uh, Mr. Um, um, thank you, Chairperson. I've made um, yeah, actually, the co host, so he no, he okay. can flight it. I've made him you, you can do it on your side, you have been enabled. Thank you very much. I see that it um, it has now been enabled. Um, I think you know, prior to me starting, I think um, many of the aspects that you introduced in the in the beginning of the conversation um, are very very similar to our observations that we have found particularly in, in this particular area um, and, and I think there's quite a lot of alignment it's certainly in terms of, um, of, of, of that particular aspect um, I'm just having a problem with this particular computer to get the change the uh, page to, to change, I'm afraid. We, I may need to have to ask if you could present on your side, please. Um, oh, there you go. Okay, I think we've got it going now. So, going. so I, th I think just in terms of, you know, what I'd like to take take to, to take the subcommittee through, it's, it's very much a tactical view on what we find on the ground. Um, where do we find the issues? You know, what is our relationship within the SNDF and within uh, SAPS? And, and also just a touch in terms of the technology and the technology opportunities, um, you know, particularly um, with respect to the physical barriers that are going on and as well as what are the alternatives or complementary technologies that can be brought to bear um, in, a, in a broader picture in order to resolve the, this kind of challenge. But, you know, taking a step back and, 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 and in assessing from, from a NetStar perspective, where do we find um, the areas of most interest? And again, it's down in the Cozy Bay area um, and in the Lobombo area less so in the Eswatini areas, in the Bight Bridge areas, and even more less so in the neighboring states, Botswana, Namibia, and so on. So what we're finding on a day-to-day -day basis is that um, the areas down leading into Mozambique is certainly the chosen preference at this stage. Um, I think it's true to say that as we work together and as we close loopholes, uh, we know that uh, the criminals will look for other access points as well. So it's going to be an ongoing interaction in order to resolve this problem. Uh, in terms of the detail, uh, the Cozy Bay area, the borderline is long. Um, we know that the SNDF do cover this area, um, but again, you need specific equipment and resources availability in order to do it. We do find the wall uh, effective, but again, it's a physical barrier and it's a barrier that's going to need ongoing maintenance and support. Um, and uh, as my uh, colleague in the industry pointed out, uh, there are mechanisms to circumvent this kind of physical barrier by building bridges over and so on. However, having said that it is a physical limitation, it does force uh, the criminal elements to seek alternatives or at least to slow them down. Uh, our experiences down in the Labombo area, um, we have a, a strong relationship with the authorities 
uh, down there um, at the port of entry. And I do understand, the, obviously, that um, the role with the, the SNDF within the port of entry is somewhat restricted. But we do find that uh, we do certainly have some issues that are, are SAP shift dependent. Um, some shifts are strong, some shifts are less so. So again, it's, there's, there's always going to be a human element that's, that's involved. The Cozy Bay area, strong relationship with SNDF, cooperation is very good and we're sharing um, information on a daily basis down at Lobombo. Again, relationships with SNDF are good. Um, we are working together and we have a, a good working relationship in that particular region as well. Um, I think what is also very important is, and again, talking to the collaboration, is how we can share information and intelligence um, with each other. And I think this is going to be absolutely crucial moving forward. Um, in, in terms of the technology, I, I'd like to touch on the technology because in many instances, the technology is more scalable than the physical barriers. Um, what we have already implemented um, is uh, what we call uh, advanced number plate recognition or license plate recognition cameras along known routes. Um, as was pointed out earlier on, some of these thieves are that brazen, they do not change the registration plates and, and we're able to pick these up. So very much part of our strategy is you've got to get to the vehicle before it even gets close to the border. Uh, and this is where these, these technologies are deployed. We've also uh, recognized that a, a dedicated secure channel that could move across both SNDF, SAPS and KZN, wildlife and so on, and the tracking companies would also be very beneficial in certain areas. Again, this is all talking to the ability for us to collaborate with each other. What we have picked up in our field operations, and again, this may talk a little bit to how the SNDF are able to demarcate the, you know, the 10 kilometer area, is the availability of modern GPS type equipment. Um, to have that on the ground is, is, is a relatively simple implementation, and it's very, very effective in terms of defining you know, where you are relative to the border. Aerial observation is absolutely key to our recovery operations, um, particularly up in the metropolitan areas. We do most of our recoveries using helicopters and airborne platforms. And similarly in the border areas, it's equally as important, if not more important, given the vast areas that need to be covered. Um, as uh, my colleague pointed out a little earlier on, certainly there are now uh, opportunities to look at dro drones and uh, unmanned uh, aircraft in order to do that. Um, and we believe that uh, if we were to set up a network of aerial observations across the core areas that we know are, are, are the targeted areas for border crossing, we would certainly be able to pick up quite quickly where there is movement and that would be either by day or by night using some of the infrared technologies and so on. Another effective method that we have also found is we do fly our own reconnaissance low-level flights over these areas and we identify where there are new tracks that are being formed. Where we find such tracks, we deploy what we refer to as a bush cam. Uh, this is a small portable camera that uh, detects movement, takes a photo and sends it to us. So again, we are able to detect movement in areas on deserted roads or freshly made paths and we're able to intercept and recover the vehicles. The other aspect to also look at, and again, it talks more to the visible uh, policing type strategies is to have weekly disruptive operations for them to be very random in their nature and where they operate. Again, it brings a degree of uncertainty as to where the security forces will be at what time, and it makes it that much more difficult for the criminal elements to, to operate unhindered. I think just in terms of interventions to curb cross-border, um, I think, again, we spoke a little earlier of the concrete wall. I think the concrete wall it will be very, is very effective where it's deployed in specific areas. Uh, 
we do have um, a situation where we find in the Cozy Bay area, vehicles with false paper work and logbooks can cross quite regularly. Um, we also understand that uh, SNDF has no control in terms of what happens at the port of entry. It's really a SAPS immigration function, and we really need to work together to find um, some mechanisms to, to stop vehicles from crossing at these ports of entry. Um, you know, if we were to just anecdotally look back uh, 15 years ago, uh, in the early days, we had a a, a, a company called Unicode. Unicode used to inspect every VIN number of every vehicle that crossed the border post. Um, so that level of scrutiny um, needs to be reintroduced again to make it that much more difficult for these vehicles to cross over undetected. I think the observation duties on known routes um, used by smugglers is, is again, um, a, a very real aspect. We need to have a look at how do we detect movement um, and how do we intercept very, very quickly and who are the role players in terms of that coordinated interception. So the ongoing uh, patrols and visibility of forces are again critical. I have touched on that a little earlier on and as well as the drones. I think the Control within the ports of entry and stronger leadership is certainly something that needs to possibly be considered as well, as well as better policing roadblocks en route to the borderline and the ports of entry by the relative parties. Uh, it's very difficult as soon as a vehicle is very close to that uh, border crossing area um, to do anything about it. You actually need to get to the vehicle prior to that point um, arising. Just a, a little bit about NetStar. Um, we've been in the stolen vehicle recovery business since uh, 1994. Over a million subscribers who trust us with their vehicles. So we've been recovering vehicles for a long time. Um, we've essentially deployed technology as the primary uh, means to recovering vehicles. Um, but we do recognize more and more so that a collaborative requirement in terms of the vehicle recovery is now required. Uh, syndicates are extremely advanced. They are sophisticated, uh, using jamming equipment and so on to render technology um, ineffective and, and, and to move vehicles around. And hence, that's why we need to create a much broader industry-wide network and collaborate to stop these kind of uh, crimes perpetrating. Uh, just in terms of who we are, we're part of the JSC listed Altron group, and uh, we, we are fully certified ISO, Sierra, and Visa, and ICAT uh, certified operation. Um, so that, in short, is uh, the uh, the view from, from NetStar. I don't know if there are any questions. Thank, thank you very much um, uh, for this uh, presentation. I think what, what is missing in both uh, presentation um, is your, your success, success rate in recovering uh, vehicles. Um, <clears throat> uh, in the, you know, beyond the borders. Um, I don't know if you do have that information. Uh, and two, the values uh, involved, the SNDF and possibly the SAPS can only give you a uh, values of um, cars uh, recovered and impounded. Uh, you would have uh, accurate or close to accurate values of uh, cars uh, that, um, you know, were could have been successfully crossed over. Uh, and uh, thirdly, <clears throat> it's, 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 I, I don't know if uh, the, the insurance uh, industry is uh, very much uh, part of uh, what you are doing. I know that you are evaluated, uh, but in the end, when a vehicle is lost, <clears throat> uh, uh, you know, they're expected to pay <clears throat> because, uh, as, as, yeah. Uh, so I, I, I thought probably you'd um, also touch on the importance of uh, bringing 
the insurance industry into the discussion. It's just that I don't know how coordinated they are. It's easy to deal with uh, the trackers because there aren't too many in the, in the country. But with uh, the insurance uh, industry, with the insurance companies dotted all over, I'm not too sure if they have their own body that speaks uh, on the on their behalf. It's a matter I have not uh, have not been able to um, check, but I will hear from you because you deal with them on a daily mm -hmm. basis. And the uh, colleagues, the, the the presentation is on the table. We we have three presentations. Uh, one from uh, the general that deals. Uh, with uh, deployment in, in general, and uh, two uh, from the two uh, companies that are in the business of tracking uh, vehicles. All right. I uh, <clears throat> uh, don't know if I see hands. Uh, I use the the board, uh, or there's a site um, on on uh, where people can raise hands. Um, uh, I can see Mr. Raider's hand. Uh, over to you, sir. Mr. Raider, Dennis Raider. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Um, yes, good evening, everybody. Thank you for the presentations. I'm going to get straight into it because I've got a, I've got quite a lot to cover, Chair, and I think that, uh, um, yeah, it's three very, very intense presentations, all with different aspects. I think General Sangwene, thank you for your uh, presentation. Always nice to see you, sir. Uh, you thought you'd getting off lightly because uh, Kubus is not online tonight, but uh, but yeah, it's my turn tonight. So so there we go. So no, General, no. I'm going to start with your presentation, if I may. Um, number of questions. The first one relates to Operation Corona, um, and of course, I think it ties in quite directly with the presentations we've just seen uh, from the two companies. And it's, it's, so the first question is, what about the use of cyber, uh, satellite, um, intelligent control mechanisms on the border? And it was, it was most interesting for me to note from, from NetStar's presentation specifically, um, which are the high risk areas where they're finding the majority of, of, of issues. And, and make no mistake, as soon as you uh, cover those two up, and interestingly, I mean, I, I know part of that border and it's, it's quite difficult to get across. Uh, so you, you need to at least follow some of the main routes um, if you want to get to get, get across there. So um, it should be reasonably easy to, to, to put a, a few blockages in the way and, and, and to stop that. Um, certainly, especially with the use of things like drones, things like uh, motion detection cameras, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that, that are readily available these days. Um, so just, yeah, general on Op Corona, what about getting a little bit smarter with, with how we're patrolling those borders? Uh, then of course, again, the, the matter that was brought up on TV the other day, the corruption by our own soldiers. Uh, and I think it was mentioned as well now uh, in one of the presentations uh, from the company's effect that, uh, um, Everyone has their price, but some prices are very low and disappointingly so. So um, what, what, what sort of mechanisms are in place uh, to, to prevent corruption and make it a little bit more difficult um, for our own people to be assisting uh, with nefarious activities when they're actually supposed to be there, preventing those nefarious activities? Um, and then, of course, you know, I know, again, I always harp on about my hometown of Midval, but I know that here we've, we've set up a bunch of, of what they call sniper cameras. It's got uh, number plate recognition. Uh, it works like a charm, and I'm sure the, the guys from, from Netstar and Tracker both know that uh, criminals don't drive around in Midval because they know they're going to get picked up and they're, they're going to get caught. So, uh, you know, what about these, these, these sniper cameras? Uh, personally, I would like to set more traditional types of snipers for some of these guys, and I think the general will probably share my opinion favoring a military solution, but I'm talking now about the, the sniper cameras, the smart technology for Op Corona. That's question one, really. Uh, question two relates to Op Mistral, and, and, and 15 Sire C is being relieved by 21 Sire. 
Um, can you just give us an idea uh, what size what size that deployment is? Uh, I was going to ask companies, but I think probably an actual headcount is is, is best. Uh, how many are coming out and, and how many are going back in to, to replace? Um, and then, of course, always with Mistral is what's the state of the serviceability of our equipment? Because that, of course, influences the United Nations uh, financial uh, refund or, or, or payment that comes to us in exchange for our services. So, so what, what is that equipment looking like? Uh, is there fresh equipment going up? Uh, if, if you can give us an idea of that. Um, and any idea from from the United Nations how long this is this this operation is still going to be continuing for? Um, if you can give us that that information, let's move then to Operation Vikela. Uh, the deployment's just been extended for a further three months. Uh, if you can give us an idea, is, is this to gather more intel intelligence? Uh, what exactly is happening uh, in Mozambique? Um, you know, with with that extension, have, have we got enough intelligence there? Do we know what the actual situation is? Um, now, there was a mention there that there's a possible follow-up deployment under scenario five. Uh, any idea what size we're looking at uh, and who's going to carry the costs? Again, uh, is this going to be an, an AU project or is South Africa going to be funding that? Um, and then, of course, the, the next one said that uh, there's some assistance with logistical support um, that's, that's going to be going through. Uh, you know, with one or two C-130s, uh, is that sufficient? Is, is there going to be more Oryxes sent up there? Maybe Royfalk? Um, you know, what do you mean by saying that uh, uh, assistance with, with logistical uh, um, uh, support? Next one, then we go, uh, yeah, sorry, continuing on Vikela. Uh, just on your slide, four of four on, on, on Vikela, you said that South African forces have gained huge prides and made a positive difference. Uh, just if you can expand a little bit, because, you know, a lot of the media is going, is focusing on the Mozambican and particularly on the Rwandan forces uh, and saying, that uh, our forces have kind of been giving deployed more in a backup uh, type of situation and on the periphery. Now you say again there on your fourth bullet point that we've been in the forefront and taken a lead in the conduct of offensive. The, the media is not, not not giving that impression. Uh, perhaps you can can help us. Uh, is the media being unfair to us, uh, or are we more in a a kind of a backup or a support role, um, and so on? The third bullet point on that slide, sorry, I'm jumping around a little bit, but it says that the terrorist units have been dislodged from their bases. Um, and yes, I think that, that this is something that we've seen. Uh, have they been dislodged? Have they been scattered? Are they in hiding? Or is it a case of, of the terrorists moving north? And I think that it, it's quite important to see that there's been a little bit of um, uh, noise around Burundi and, 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 and Tanzania uh, as well. Uh, indicating that there's some activity there from, if not the same forces, then certainly similar. Uh, is, is it the general's experience that we appear to be pushing uh, these insurgents um, further up into uh, into Africa and, and moving them along the line? Great. And then the last one I have for the general just relates to Operation Copper. Um, and yeah, Operation currently paused and we understand why, but just a, a question is, what about our international responsibilities to patrol the seas around the Prince Edward Islands? Uh, are, are we still doing that, or is that also on pause at the moment? Uh, I understand that a lot of uh, a lot of the activity has moved up and, and being taken up as part of the Vakela operation, but uh, Op Copa, yeah, should still have some components that are, are getting some attention. Thank you, General. If you can deal with those for me, I would be most grateful. Moving on to the to the two gentlemen, and, and Ned Star and Tracker, I, I realize that uh, you, you're competitors and you probably uh, uh, don't want to be lumped together, but I'm going to lump you together anyway, if you don't mind. Uh, Mr. Nobo, um, the last time I used the word nomenclature in Parliament, I've got a bunch of funny looks. I was thrilled to hear someone else use that word, one of my favorites. Um, but but 
generally, yeah, I, I think I, I've mentioned earlier when I was talking about um, um, Operation Corona, the, uh, very interesting to me to note that, that, that it's mostly on the Mozambican border that there appears to be a, a, a big issue um, that was specifically on the NetStar uh, on, on your map. And I was wondering if Tracker has the same experience or if you've seen different, different patterns. Um, and then, gentlemen, I, th I think you may have missed an opportunity because uh, uh, I unfortunately missed the introduction um, where the chair introduced the topic. But, um, you know, I'm sure the purpose of you being here was, was to, A, give us information and, and B, maybe ask us for some things. And I, I didn't see you asking for anything uh, in, in, in your last slide, in your conclusion, saying, please help with this or please guide us with this or whatever. But from the from the content, Chair, um, it would appear to me that that certainly there, 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 there needs to be a, a, a better engagement, probably with the SANDF, uh, with the Border Control uh, Management Authority, um, with SAPS, um with uh probably Durko as well um to to get a little bit deeper into, into these discussions uh Sanral certainly has a role to play and i spoke about the sniper cameras uh that are being used but uh you know sanral has got all sorts of uh cameras that they take photographs of, of my car with uh as i'm driving around Gauteng. i'm sure they've got the ability to put cameras up on some of their other major routes, um, and, and, and certainly, you know, make an impact in terms of this particular fight uh, and enhance the levels of, of cooperation. Um, so, yeah, just just I think that probably a, a further engagement uh, would be most useful uh, in terms of this because I I do believe it's something that needs to be stopped. Um, and if the Joint Standing Committee on Defence can be uh, the guys that kind of bring up one of these uh, uh, work sessions, like we've done before on, on, on various other topics, uh, inviting various role players to the table um, and, and spend a few hours getting different different aspects together, pulling different people in and finding ways to cooperate. Um, I think that can only be a good thing. So yeah, I, I think, gentlemen, thank you for your presentations. They were, they were informative. I certainly uh, learned quite a bit from them. Um, but you know, he has your opportunity. I'm opening the door. Uh, what can we do for you? How can how can we help? What 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 do you need from from Parliament? Thank you, Chair. I'm done. No, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Raider. Uh, may I invite uh, Miss Lechwase? Miss Lechwase. Thank you very much, Chair. Let me start by greeting all on the platform and welcome the presentations that were brought before us. Chairperson, I have only a few questions for the general. Maybe one question might come from the Operation Prosper. I would like to know the total cost of both the deployments of KZN and Gauteng and the deployments of soldiers to the previous elections of local government. The other question is from Operation Vigela. I want to ask understand, Chair, on these deployments and operations to this SADC mission, are we having sufficient or enough and reliable, reliable aircraft to ensure that the purpose of these missions are accomplished? The last question that I have, Chair, is whether we, we all saw that previously it was reported throughout the media platforms that soldiers were being fed with rotten food. Have you checked maybe before the deployments that the food that the soldiers will be given are good for their health? And on Operation Copper, Chairperson, the annual report of 2020-2021, the department missed its target for the maritime patrols. So one would want to know if, 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 if the Navy, the SA Navy has met its target set in relation to this operation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you very much. All right, <clears throat> General, uh, is, I know you would also want to um, participate uh, in the discussion with the, the companies uh, from the trucking industry. Um, I, 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 I would suggest that we do the following, that we start, that we 
uh, deal with them now, uh, uh, ask questions, make comments, and then invite them back to uh, respond. And then when I were done with them, uh, I would then invite you to come and then deal with the questions that are specific to your presentation. Uh, I, I want us, but I will still allow members, um, you know, to pose questions uh, this way and that way. And uh, but I, will, I would prefer that the, we start with the response from the track from the companies. Once we are done with them, and then move to you, so that you, if you want to comment and express an opinion on their presentation or the discussion with them. You are then able to do so. All right, uh, Honorable Shelembe, you are next. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, Chairperson, I think I mean uh, Honorable Ryder has covered a lot uh, of the question that uh, one was going to ask. But um, Chairperson, I mean, uh, in your introduction, you spoke more especially about, I mean, the people coming in and out uh, of the country without, I mean, uh, proper, I mean, uh, permission um, to come to the country. Now, just want to check because if one looks, I mean, uh, in the country, one of uh, the biggest problems that is crippling the economy of this country are the people who are coming to this country illegally and coming to sell, I mean, uh, the goods that are not, I mean, a lawful. And what, I mean, is there anything that uh, the Department of Defense, especially say uh, General Sangwin, he thinks that can be a uh, use or can assist the department to reduce, I mean, uh, the number of people coming to the country without, I mean, proper documentation. I'm very, very worried. Whilst I mean, you're speaking of, I mean, the smuggling of the vehicles from the uh, country to outside, but the people, I think, uh, the only way to come and do that is through coming without any proper documentation. And uh, two, chairperson, uh, when we're doing the oversight uh, on borders, there was that uh, challenge of uh, broken vehicles and also, I mean, vehicles without, I mean, the tires. Uh, because of the procurement issue that is central. I want to know if, I mean, that problem has still not been uh, uh, sorted out. If, me, I mean, they are still struggling, I mean, to move, I mean, uh, from one point to another point with those vehicles, like uh, the four by fours as they require. And maybe I didn't get well on the issue of the Jersey barrier that they like uh, on that um, Costa Bay area where, I mean, uh, the walls were built, but the project is not complete. If there's any uh, progress or program or assistance from other departments to ensure, I mean, that uh, that walls that are being built to stop uh, or to prevent uh, the smuggling of the vehicles from us to Mozambique, whether any other department has come uh, to assist in that uh, issue. Chairperson, also, I'm worried about, I mean, uh, the issue of, I mean, uh, the members of the SNTF who are not honest when it comes to looking after the borders, who are working with uh, the criminals. I just want to know from Ubabu uh, Sangwin, uh, since he's responsible, because if, I mean, uh, this thing continues, it makes his department or his area of uh, uh, responsibility becomes a failure. What, I mean, uh, he's uh, doing I mean, uh, to ensure that, I mean, uh, these people who are involved in that are exposed. Because now we have seen that some soldiers are working with uh, taking the goods, uh, allowing the people to go from South Africa to Mozambique, uh, whereas we have, I mean, the soldiers. Is there any improvement or anything that's being done by, I mean, uh, him to see that this thing is stopped? Uh, before, I mean, a big damage, I mean, is caused because once this thing becomes uncontrollable where soldiers are working with the criminals, I think the country will not be uh, protected as we are expecting. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Shelembe. And um, I also see uh, Mr. Motsomai. Uh, Motsomai, Honorable Motsomai.
Thanks, Chairperson. Hey, I've got a problem with network here. I'm audible, Chairperson. Yes, you are, sir. Uh, audible. Okay, thanks so much. Chairperson, make about to put a general somewhere in the I the color is even a little on a fellow on because when I little color is in a little tart, Lady Lady the the flight the the plane is even a little on the way the the craft. I seven and a little on it and I get the salon disabilities who I keep pushing apartheid. It can be one a little longer, but the regular thing, cha, because when the bad color is around, not one a longer no. They are sure and it is a man mona. Let me let them know how to mona. I don't so na little Nernalo kopa na le masole kolo ya bona eshwile a gona le di change tse ba di ntse u for masola ro ke a le boga tshe eh thank you very much um uh, mr mats honor matsumai uh, general i hope you um, understood the the question um but uh, obviously you we'll deal with it when you deal with all the questions um, towards the end um all right Colleagues, che, che, if you understood it, then I also understood it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so we'll need some. You are right. So we'll need some assistance. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, I hope other colleagues will come in and, and assist. Right, colleagues. I, I think we 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 now have exhausted all the the, the questions. Uh, the first round of uh, of questions. And uh, I'm sure we'll have a focused dis- discussion um, at, at, at some point. Uh, it's, it's a pity that we are now almost at the end of the year. And uh, where we look at uh, these strategies more closely, there is the deputy minister in the meeting. Um, uh, but I would want the deputy minister to comment once we are done with all the the, 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 the responses from the, the colleagues from the industry and, and possibly from the, the defense force. All right, uh, colleagues, we this is where we are and um, it's mouthful. And um, all right, who do we start with? Uh, uh, can we start with you? Um, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, let me perhaps start from back to front uh, with sort of Mr. Ryder's uh, commentary um, and some of his sort of uh, summary of, of what he heard from us. I think we are in effect asking for a deep dive in terms of from a collaborative effort to work uh, under the leadership of the Joint Standing Committee to figure out how to deploy said technology if technology is part of the solution. This includes capability like smart cameras, like uh, license plate recognition, and various other technologies, which at this point in the call, I will not get into. But I think technology does have a sort of curbing effect in terms of uh, managing vehicle crime, because it gives you an early indicator of movement of vehicles, be it cloned vehicles that are going to commit the crime or vehicles that have in effect been stolen already. So cameras do form part of that solution. So there's two things that I'm almost landing. The first is uh, part of my ask was that we create this joint team that would really focus on what the solution is. I think if it wasn't clear, Mr. Ryder, part of what I'm keen not to do is to prescribe exactly what the answer is, because I think the committee would give breath under perhaps the leadership of the SANDF in terms of where that technology could be deployed. I'm, I'm very mindful of the sort of legal uh, constraints in terms of that. One of the difficulties, Chair, around giving the exact figures of the number of vehicles that are uh, um, uh, recovered is I think in a broad sense, uh, we can give a very good indicator of recovery rates in country. And I think that's publicly available knowledge in terms of what the recovery rates are. What makes it particularly uh, uh, challenging uh, cross-border is that one, um, the total number of vehicles that go across the border, there's an indicative number that says roughly 30 or so percent of vehicles that are stolen make our way through to the border. 
but that's an indicative number and a deeper dive would be required. The second issue is that even in instances where vehicles are uncovered across the border, to bring them back into country is often a challenge. So that will really dilute the numbers from creating a, an indicator. The, the third element is, I think there was a question around the insurance industry. We do work quite closely with one another, perhaps under the auspices of the South African Insurance Crime Bureau, where it includes all the industry bodies uh, that really look at this from multiple dimensions. So in other words, one from a tracking company, two from an insurable risk perspective, and a recovery perspective. I think what also creates some challenges for them is in some countries, the laws don't allow, for example, a third party. They require the original owner of the vehicle. Now, if your insurer has paid you out, there is no way I will go to a foreign current country to recover a vehicle. So there's all sorts of dimensional uh, and legal and regulatory constraints that prevent that. The, 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 the sort of last aspect I'd like to touch on um, to Mr. Ryder's question is um, from the point of view of the values um, of, of, um, of, of the vehicles that, that we have a, an indication of. Leon, I don't know if you just want to jump in there and just give an indicative value. Thank you, Duma. Um, thank you, uh, Honourable Chair. Um, so, so the, the, the indicative value that, that we have currently um, is, is, is approximate to the value of 308 uh, million rand uh, worth of vehicles that, that has been recovered. Um, and um, yes, uh, does that answer, answer the question for, for Mr. Dennis Ryder? Yes, so this is 308 million of vehicles recovered. That's correct. Is, is, it, is it over is, a period or per annum? Uh, it is our current financial year. Is it in one year? In one financial year, that's correct. Uh, remember, it's rand value, 308 million South African rand. But I think uh, what's important to take away is the figure could really vary periodically um, and is also influenced by various kind of circumstantial aspects, including the different patterns of lockdowns that we had related to COVID. Um, but really gives you the substantial nature of the scale of, of vehicle crime. Uh, and if you consider the types of vehicles that are attractive, i.e. LDVs, I don't want to maybe mention them by name, but I think being that you've been on the ground already, you'd have quite a, a, a clear idea of the types of vehicle that are particularly attractive for these purposes and for these syndicates. All right. Okay, you may continue you, uh, with uh, the other responses. Um, I, I, I think the, 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 the other comments that you made, Chair, was um, one you were hoping that would give you an indication of the values. I think Leon has just landed some of those elements. I also think that, uh, as I said, I was careful not to specify uh, what the solution is. But I really, really fundamentally believe that, uh, if, if I may, that a bit of a deep dive workshop style session where we can then unpack the technology tools, um, either ourselves or together with our partners from a collegial perspective, is what needs to happen. Because there is technology already on the ground, but the scale of that technology and where we prioritize or optimize that technology, I think, is the issue. So while we may see a certain border po post, i.e. Kumati Port was one mentioned, or Cozy Bay or Mosina, uh, maybe one view, but there's another sort of uh, 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 other elements which involve other types of uh, seductive crime, if I can use that term. For example, the Bloemfontein uh, Lesotho borders. We might not see as many vehicles, but there's cattle crime and other kind of uh, large scale machinery crime, which in volume is far less, but in terms of the detrimental uh, nature to the farming community. So, how you'd prioritize and deploy. 
um, the technology tools is also of importance, but one would need to take guidance and firm decisions. The last aspect that I wish to touch on was the issue of the MOUs and the NDAs. Less about the N NDAs per se, but more around the MOU, which will really give breath and a mandate to say how far do we go uh, and how do we really operationalize these aspects. I did mention that we have the benefits of having uh, uh, deployments on the ground. In, in other words, our own teams that help recoveries. But we've really seen that when you create a large force, a force multiplier, so you create a chassis between private security, uh, our South African police, our SNDF, as well as other bodies, is really how you tackle and break the back, uh, backbone of crime. Lastly, uh, I think some of our uh, 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 members of the committee, honorable members uh, like um, Honorable uh, Shelembe, mentioned the issue of, of the movement of people or human centric crime, whether it's undocumented, whether it's contraband. You know, vehicles form a key basis because there's, there's uh, opportunistic shopping, as we call it, where undocumented individuals go across country. But in order to ferry the goods across, it's far easier if you have a motor vehicle. It's far easier if you have a firearm. So really, when you tackle vehicle crime, it becomes a key uh, in terms of breaking the backbone of crime. Um, lastly, uh, Mr. Ryder also touched on, I mustn't forget this point, that we are competitors. But I think if we want to give breath to the assertion that uh, we want to create a, a safer South Africa, um, some, some activities are well beyond commercial interest because it, it kind of creates a benefit either way. So if they recover vehicles, in other words, NetStar, or we recover vehicles, it means a South African's vehicle is returned. It means a South African is safe. And it may mean our neighboring countries, to some degree, are also that little bit safer. I just wanted to land those few points. No, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ngobo. Uh, Mr. Morgan. Thank you. Um, I think um, just to echo some of the sentiments um, already expressed, um, I, I certainly agree with them. Um, particularly the South African Crime Insurance Bureau, Bureau would be a very, very good starting point in terms of a central body uh, representing the insurance industry. Um, I think the reality is where we're sitting right now is we do have good working relationships on the ground. Um, I think what we don't have is a broader framework under which we can operate and a broader operating model under which we can operate. So I would uh, strongly suggest in terms of an ask would be some further engagements as to how do we put together an operating framework um, between the industry, between the South African Defence Force and the other law enforcement uh, agencies for that matter. Uh, the, the discussion in terms of the value of vehicles that um, are moving across the border um, is, is a very difficult one to, to quantify. Um, some of the challenges in, in getting to that number is we find within the tracking industry, we in fact recover the vast majority of vehicles within the first few hours of them being stolen. In other words, those vehicles that would have made their way across the border, we recover quickly within the first couple of hours. Um, the other problem that we face in this particular uh, area is we find that those vehicles which we do not recover, um, there's, and, 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 and this is by far the minority, of vehicles. We don't know where they are destined to. Are they in fact cloned and recirculated within the country? Are they broken down into car parts? Very often the case. So where we're sitting right now, it would be very, very difficult for us to make any kind of estimation as to what's moving across the border. Also, when one looks at our particular carpool, our car park, which are our customer base, they fit into a certain segment within the industry. Um, and we know for certain that of the vast 
majority of vehicles in South Africa are possibly not insured and possibly not fitted with tracking type devices. So I think in terms of getting to an estimation, I think if one were to look at the SAP statistics and then take a percentage of that might be, you know, an, 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 an approach to take. Um, so yeah, just to wrap it up, certainly an, op an opportunity to engage uh, with the authorities to put together an operating model, and for us collectively as an industry to collaborate and work together, which we do, it's very often that we find that we will get into a scenario where we recover multiple vehicles, and those vehicles will be both our vehicles, our customers, and other tracking customers. So in a sense, we do collaborate on the ground, um, and then that's an ongoing um, uh, approach that we do take. Um, uh, I, I trust I've answered at least some of the questions adequately. No, no, you, 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 you did. Um, I think you, you have covered a good ground. Uh, you have actually, your presentation, uh, both uh, presentations have actually met the objectives um, of this uh, meeting. Uh, we've teased out uh, issues. Uh, we know exactly where uh, we all stand on, 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 on the matter. Uh, we, I agree that a once-off meeting uh, is not going to help uh, deal, um, diagnose the, the, the problem uh, in any uh, much uh, in depth. And uh, that, that we need a, a deep dive kind of a, a session. Um, we will certainly reflect on, on, on that and what a, a appropriate uh, platform uh, we use uh, to deal with these uh, issues as suggested. But we do have the, the chief of uh, joint uh, operations. Uh, uh, we don't have the SAPS in this meeting. I would have loved to have taken the discussion in their presence as well. Um, maybe the security cluster in general. Um, we are part of the security cluster and uh, we have uh, received this presentation and um, maybe we need to extend it to a broader security cluster within, within government. But that's one uh, part of uh, you know, the security establishment in the country. We also have the security industry uh, broadly that uh, <clears throat> it's, it's equipment, uh, equipment and um, the other technologies that in my view may actually outnumber uh, that which is available uh, within the state. Uh, well-armed uh, industry, you know. So, well, I'm, I'm, I'm just speaking from, you know, my ignorance. But they are there, and you can see the amount of, um, you know, um, equipments uh, and the resources they have at their disposal that they are really a force uh, not to be ignored when we discuss uh, matters uh, like this. And then you have you and, um, and, and, and other people as well. So, so we will have to try and distill this, see how we take it forward as, as the committee. But we thought that because we had started this process, we were on the ground and we received this information and uh, we, we, we need to process it. But before we can take it any further, we need to get what, how will this uh, impacts on, on you as people who are directly affected uh, by this. Yes, yes, our people are directly affected. You act on their behalf. It's that you can't get everybody commenting and uh, you are then able to co coordinate it. But there again, you are saying the uninsured, uninsured, the untracked, inverted commas, uh, you will not have the, the, their own information. And I would imagine those who lie outside your perimeters, they are many. 
Uh, there are many, and uh, who also, you know, fall victim of the of the crime. Now, thank you very much for for the information you have, you have given us. Please know that uh, your information was recorded. It's public platform it was on one of the TV stations, and uh, but I don't think you've re you've released uh, the secrets. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so it's our meetings are public. I should have actually primed you even before you made the presentation. All right, uh, colleagues, uh, here we are, and uh, let me just check the the the, the chief of operations and uh, and the deputy minister if they too want to express a comment on your on on this on on your presentations before I excuse you and then move to deal with the responses from the from the chief of um, from the from the from the, from the lieutenant chief, from the general all right um, general do you want to express a comment on their presentation thank you chair and please allow me to recognize the presence of the deputy minister of defense and military veterans uh, in the meeting um, yes, um, I would like to say, uh, Chair and members of the committee, um, in the SNDF and particular joint operations, uh, we appreciate the work done by um, these uh, tracker companies um, in respect of uh, the fight against um, stealing and hijacking of vehicles, and particularly uh, being taken across the borderline um where we are um it it is our responsibility to um work there secondly um i also want to appreciate their effort in in providing um solutions uh, we, have a of, we have a problem setting your video on uh, general unless it, it 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 interferes with your with the audio let me try. Chair. Okay, please do. Sure, thanks. Thank you, Chair. I also wanted to say um, we appreciate their effort in providing solutions um, to the sketch of um, illegal cross border crime um, when vehicles are stolen and taken across the borderline. Uh, members of the committee, I also want to confirm that we work together and we cooperate. Um, with these uh, different uh, tracker companies, especially the two, uh, Nesta and Trekker, uh, particularly in KZN, uh, in the north of KZN, uh, Manguzi, Kosipi area, as well as in Pumalanga, and to a relative degree in Limpompo as well. Um, we, we consider them or we regard them as force multipliers uh, to us. And uh, vice versa, we are also their force multiplier. Uh, both uh, environments uh, achieve uh, successes or achieve their objectives um, with the work that we do uh, together. And, and over the past years, we've achieved um, considerable successes of uh, apprehending and uh, stolen vehicles, um, they, 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 they are operational and technical level uh, way and cooperation that how we do uh, these things that I'm not going to speak about um, here on this platform. But yes, we, we work uh, very much together and we appreciate it. And um, going forward, uh, what they presented, uh, other possible um, uh, technology and, and in the future, we are going to consider as um, the committee is well aware that we have started um, going to the um, environment of technology. Currently, we are using low-tech uh, physical structures as they've indicated, um, being military people, we believe in obstacles and then, but yes, we have started with technology and what they've indicated and presented, we are going to consider, we are already considering um, not necessarily from them in terms of um, uh, technology, I submit to. 
Yeah, thank you very much. I, I thought it was opportune uh, to call you because I know we, we have given you a small amount um, of money to deal with the technology. And uh, <clears throat> so I think it was appropriate that to make the comments that you have started um, and you are, uh, you know, upscaling. Um, of course, uh, resources uh, permitting, but obviously, <clears throat> given the the number of demands on the state pass, I would wish the 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 the, the industry to see if they cannot uh, extend the hand. Um, you know, I know they're doing something; and they are paying tax. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure they, 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 they can say, well, look, <clears throat> uh, we can sponsor this uh, because it's, 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 uh, it, it benefits uh, all of us. Uh, it's not a demand, it's something that they must consider. All right, uh, DM, uh, Deputy Minister in the meeting, uh, just on this part, uh, before we move off uh, to deal with the, the, the deployment of, uh, of, of uh, you know, soldiers. Uh, at the end, if we could just uh, close on this, um, uh, say a few comments on as we close this discussion with the trekking industry. All right. I don't know uh, what happened uh, to to the deputy minister. I did get an indication that he was in the meeting uh, using someone else's uh, gadget, but no, it's fine. All right, look, we would want to end it at this, and uh, we will certainly reflect on this. And when we uh, extend an invitation to you again, please don't say, ah, we've been to these people and... Um, uh, yeah, we, we thought we we, we should uh, were part of the security cluster, and we should know what it, it's happening because we are at this level, but we are also public representatives, and people come to us uh, for answers, and we don't have the answers. Uh, so it's good that we have had this discussion, colleagues. Um, Trekker, thank you very much, uh, Babungobo, uh, Nesta, Babungobo and the team, Nesta. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation this evening. We we'll certainly, you know, we've at least established this relationship. And uh, uh, you look great, Ngobo. Thank you very much, Chair, and the rest of the committee members, and as well as the Deputy Minister for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Babungobo. Uh, Mr. Morgan. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, we look forward to. Uh, further engagements on this um, on this front. It's uh, it's it's been a long time coming, and it's a wonderful opportunity, and we'll embrace it. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. You guys are free to leave uh, whenever you think it is um, you you whenever you want to. All right, colleagues, we now can, we now can move to the to receive the responses from the from General Sanguine. Over to General Sanguine. Thank you, Chair, and members of the committee. Um, please allow me to start with the um, uh, Chair, I want to confirm Uri Gumtrele, Honorable Mutsamai, and on his passions. That um, he posed that are there new vehicles or aircrafts uh, that the SNGF has acquired or are still using uh, those uh, assets of the SADF? Um, yes, we are still uh, utilizing uh, vehicles, aircrafts, and vessels and other assets uh, from the SADF. Um, you'll recall that those um, assets were integrated into the SNDF in 1994. Um, all of us integrated um, personnel and equipment. 
So they belong and they are the arsenal of the South African National Defense uh, Force. Furthermore, uh, the SANDF has acquired and procured uh, aircrafts, naval vessels, and vehicles and equipment as the SANDF, and we are utilizing uh, those vehicles. So, yes, uh, we use all of them, and uh, those from the SADF era, um, uh, many of them uh, are old and uh, in terms of uh, the lifespan, and uh, we have repaired them, we are repairing them, and they are still uh, serviceable and usable. You will uh, take note that military vehicles and assets are designed um, with a lifespan of from 20 upwards. So uh, they are still um, usable and we use them. Uh, secondly, I'd like to um, respond or provide uh, feedback to Ms. Lekwase, honorable um, member. Uh, your questions regarding your request total amount or cost for incurred by the SNDF for the deployment uh, during July 2021 unrest, as well as the local government elections. Uh, currently, I do not have those figures, but those uh, figures are available um, as they were published uh, in the employment papers uh, that were presented uh, to this committee by the president of the country in authorizing these uh, deployments. So the cost and, and indicative figures uh, were presented and I believe they are available uh, in parliament with the committee. Uh, you raised the issue whether are there enough aircrafts to achieve uh, the set objectives in Operation Vikela uh, under uh, Samim. Yes, we have uh, a Samim. We do not have all the aircrafts that we would prefer to, to have um, to do the work at hand, but there are uh, adequate assets and, and uh, special aircrafts that are. Uh, in the mission area uh, that um, is being utilized during the deployment and they are uh, working wonders and, and, and really um, making the soldiers deployed to succeed uh, in what um, they are doing both rotary and fixed wing uh, as well as strategic lift. And I want to also indicate uh, to Honorable Kwasa that it is not only the Republic of South Africa or the SNDF who are deployed and contributed uh, assets. It is um, member states of uh, SADAP, a number of them, they are deployed and have uh, uh, maritime vessels, aircraft and uh, vehicles and personnel. And it is um, utilized by all of us um, in the deployment area. So yes, they are aircrafts. We we'll always wish to have more uh, in any situation, but what we have now is adequate and it is uh, doing the work required. Uh, Ms. Lefasse raised um, a very um, sore issue uh, of the media article uh, which uh, the, the newspaper got the information from one of our deployed soldiers in, in Mozambique, indicating that um, soldiers were fed rotten uh, food. Um, well, the, the inquiry is still ongoing, but even before the inquiry, uh, members of the committee, um, I will say uh, here that the information is not necessarily true. Uh, soldiers were not fed with rotten food. The situation is there was an incident where there were rations. Uh, we procure rations in the area where 
uh, members are deployed, meaning veggies, uh, starch, meat, and uh, for a period of time, and then uh, store uh, them uh, where they require to be stored, like uh, in your own house, uh, you would have groceries. So it happened that um, vegetables and meat that were stored um, in a re refrigeration unit, uh, which is a vehicle designed to have a um, refrigeration uh, cap at the back. Um, it broke down the, the, the refrigeration part, and then for a period, uh, for a few days, and over that period of days, the um, rations, meaning vegetables and meat that were stored in there, um, uh, then were rotten or became uh, not suitable for human consumption. consumption. And those uh, rations, I want to keep on saying it is the rations, my food, those rations were then disposed accordingly. A professional medical practitioner came and qualified that they are now unusable and provided the certificate and then they were destroyed. And with that uh, um, authority, then we are able to procure the same uh, uh, rations for the period and for replace. So it's more about accounting that you must have a certificate that why did you destroy? Why do you have two batches of same rations for the same period for the same number of people? During that period, the soldiers that were in base, this happens when soldiers are in base. Not every time that soldiers will be in base, they'll be out uh, in the field uh, doing work, and then there'll be those that are in the field, and then they'll rotate and come back. When you are in the base, then you have that opportunity to um, be provided with cooked meals. We call it wet rations. It's where those rations are there to cook for members to eat. And during that period, those members who were there inside the base were provided with um, uh, meals ready to eat or ration packs. That, those boxes that we carry with when we're going out to the field uh, for a week or two where you are unable to cook. There are no cooking facilities. So it, they were not fed uh, with um, rotten food. That is not uh, true. And I'll invite um, one of the members to read again that article and interrogate and apply your mind. And then you'll see that it seems like it's one of those ill-disciplined soldiers and or a rogue element who was uh, wanted to uh, maybe vent or, or, or uh, bring the organization or certain members um, uh, who are deployed into disrepute the way he or she conducted um, himself. Was it, the article does not speak only about rotten food, it added quite a number of um, other aspects like that, um, the allowances that they should get once they are there, once they are getting some, a bigger chunk of the allowances is um, uh, paid into their accounts, then there's a small for self-sustainment, small amount for self-sustainment. They, they indicated that the commander drew that money and did not give them, and then they had to borrow from him. That, that is not true. Um, there are two ways of, of providing the allowances. The members, there are finance officials in the ground, they will pay each member and each member will sign against his or her name that he's been provided or issued with the uh, allowances for that period, during that period. And or if the finance members are not um, available and it's out there in the field, the command of a specific unit will then draw the amount against the name list of the members that are going to pay to be uh, paid the actual amount provided by the finance officer, he or she signs for them. And when, when he pays, again, each member must sign on that schedule that I did receive and, and I've been given. So uh, clearly you will see that um, uh, there's a lot of uh, malfeasance in that um, uh, 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 report. Um, yes, we are looking uh, at it and trying to uh, check um, if everything is, is, is okay, but the investigation will uh, 
bring forth the actual um, situation. But as where I'm standing or seated, I'm saying uh, the issue of members giving rotten food is not true. There's a lot of untruth there, indicative that they are only getting three liters of water a day. No, it's not true. They are getting much more bottled water. And the bottled water, its uh, purpose is for soldiers to drink just as a precaution. But to cook, to wash, and to wash yourself, you use the water that is provided uh, in, in Mozambique. And, and um, we all know that if water is seen to be suspect, but when you boil it and cook it, it's got no problem. Um, uh, then they are provided potable water in terms of potable water. Um, I believe I've covered uh, that part for Ms. Um, Lengwase. Um, a response to Mr. Ryder uh, is quite um, a lot of questions. I'll try and um, uh, give feedback. Uh, in respect of Operation Copa, as I have indicated that we have taken an operational pause for Op Copa. Um, and the, the question was that, uh, so what is the situation with our application to do maritime patrols uh, to the Prince Edward and Maron Islands? Um, Honorable Ryder, as I've indicated that for operational pause, one of the reasons is the challenges that are faced by our South African Navy. Um, we've got uh, uh, vessels, limited vessels and other vessels are under repairs and other vessels are deployed. So whilst we are having vessels serviceable and uh, deployed uh, to various areas, at certain stages, yes, the obligation to the Maron Islands and Prince Edward um, uh, will be affected. Um, but when any stage when vessels are available, it proceeds, this has not been stopped. It is only Operation Copper, um, the maritime strategy or, or effort of SADAP to Mozambique Channel that is um, on pause. Um, in respect of um, consideration of surveillance in Operation Corona and or smart technology, uh, yes, uh, we have started already um, uh, last year uh, looking at uh, uh, application or in bring in a smart technology and surveillance and radars and, and yes, we were at last year provided with by National Treasury a certain a funding ring fence for both border technology and, 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 and border safeguarding facilities. Uh, we are busy with that. And uh, as I said, I appreciate what the trucking companies presented. And some of it, they are using it um, in our area. It is their equipment, uh, but it becomes a force multiplier for them and a force multiplier for us. But out of that collaboration, we are learning, we are gaining what type of, of technology is suitable in that environment. That environment is, it is different. It's in the field. Um, uh, it's far away from uh, many areas in terms of connectivity. There are a lot of challenges, but yes, we have considered that and we are. It will come in gradually, uh, Mr. Ryder. Uh, maybe as early as uh, the next financial year, hopefully. Uh, you also raised the sore issue of corruption and bribery in um, operant, Operation Corona, as was uh, captured by Kata Blanche uh, journalist uh, in Limpombo. Uh, yes, it is a very uh, troubling situation, which we are very concerned and very much unhappy. Uh, with our soldiers and actually upset with our soldiers who are involved in uh, criminality and fraud and corruption and abating um, illegal cross-border movement. When they are deployed uh, to do um, the, the counter other than assisting and when it is our obligation and an obligation of each and every member of this uh, of the society and every member of the SANDF who protect and defend the country. And what happens is that we are trying several measures um, uh, to be able to, uh, uh, to, uh, to be able to find these members before they do 
or whilst they are doing these uh, acts. And when it happens that um, uh, they were found after and uh, disciplinary actions are taken immediately, you will recall that uh, I think three or four months ago, um, there was an outcome of those investigation of the Hawks together with the Mixed Police, where seven members were arrested, ultimately arrested for having been involved in, in, in a syndicate or uh, allowing vehicles to cross the borderline in Limpombo. So action, when mem uh, those uh, culprits are arrested, it is taken and, and criminal uh, procedures uh, undertaken. And I, I want to tell to say to the committee, we will um, we do not tolerate uh, ill discipline. We do not tolerate um, uh, criminality, and we we will act harshly uh, in that regard. Um, Mr. Ryder asked the um, uh, Mistral rotation the number, uh, the post intervention brigade that is rotating. Uh, the first level is 700 members. Uh, the entire 700 uh, over the period we do rotation and the new 700 unit of 700 soldiers uh, are deployed. It's been standing for quite a time that it is 700, uh, a battalion of 700 for the post intervention brigade. Serviceability of equipment in of Mistral. Um, we have serviceable equipment. We also have unserviceable equipment. Again, it's the legacy of um, our equipment that is uh, getting obsolete and uh, which break often. Uh, furthermore, uh, the issue of the defense industry, specifically the NEL for military spec vehicles as, as the OEM, it's also providing um, a challenge for us to be able to repair, in terms of repair on time uh, our equipment. Uh, both inside the country and outside the country. Um, additionally, the funding, uh, we do not have uh, adequate funding to acquire new equipment. So we are making do with what we have. And yes, it affects the reinvestment that we're supposed to get from the United Nations, because if there is an equipment or vehicles that are unserviceable, they are not uh, reinvested accordingly to the full scale that is required to. And we are working hard on that, but it's a number of challenges, as I've uh, stated. Um, the funding being also one of them. And I know I've had people saying uh, not everything is about uh, funding, but for a vehicle or equipment, uh, you have to repair it, and it is cost. You must incur costs when you are maintaining and repairing it. Uh, secondly, if you have to replace it and buy a new one, it's also cost. So it's all about funding. The issue of Operation Vekela, you ask if we have uh, uh, enough knowledge and intel on the current situation um, and as a result of the extension, yes. In the mission area, we have um, the decision for the first three months to be extended was because um, it was indicated that there is huge successes and, and, and um, the terrorists were being hammered and uh, the deployment was gaining strides and, and gaining territory and had dislodged uh, the tourists from their areas uh, where they had uh, taken Palma under their um, control, but now it's back to uh, under control of government uh, uh, forces. And that was the reason and motivation that um, the effort of the report deployability must be extended and continue and is still continuing gaining um, uh, successes. Um, you asked who will bear the cost of possible scenario five. Uh, all peace, peacekeeping or uh, multilateral effort, uh, then the mother body uh, bear certain costs and the troop contributing country also bear certain costs. So it is the same as uh, happening now with scenario six and also with the wider peacekeeping scenario five. Um, it will be the same. But uh, I want to urge and say to the members of the committee, we cannot and should not compare uh, SADAC as a mother body and uh, compare it to the United Nations in terms of uh, capabilities and, and 
financial um, standing. So yes, there would be a difference uh, in terms of how much cost is um, a troop contributing country uh, incurring in SADAC mission uh, compared to a mission of the United Nations. And you spoke, you uh, asked the possible force levels for the uh, possible scenario five. Uh, at this stage, there is no decision uh, indicated that it is uh, doctrinally and structural that when you've achieved objectives of the, the military effort and intervention, then you go to, you, you scale it down to um, proper peacekeeping or, or uh, original peacekeeping uh, uh, effort of scenario five and where civilian elements are also um, on the ground. So we do not know, we have not decided that actually has not yet got to when that will happen or might happen and uh, what force levels uh, will be on the ground or will be re required. Um, the, your question regarding that Samim or Vigela is taking the lead and uh, whether the media is not coming through, uh, it, I, I'm not sure in terms of how far the media is, 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 is going, but yes, in the initial stages, we saw the media uh, only reflecting the, uh, how uh, the Rwandan Defense Force uh, was doing and, 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 and gaining strength and succeeding, and, and nothing from uh, Samim, or very little from Samim. I think, yes, it was the media, maybe biasness, maybe, and all that Samim being a, 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 an intervention, uh, the aspects of, of communication uh, officials was not yet in place, but uh, I think month number two, uh, we started getting media statements from the, the communications uh, office of Samim uh, reflecting uh, the successes. And by uh, month number three, there was no other way that the media can ignore what the public was saying and um, many stakeholders and, lead, and leaders um, commending the effort of uh, Samim. And uh, then the media then came on board as, as, as well. Uh, so currently we, we are getting, I think, enough recognition, uh, the effort of um, Samim. Um, I, I hope uh, that I've covered all um, the questions. Um, uh, Mr. Shelembe also, uh, as the last um, part of the of the questions uh, posed, uh, you asked Mr. Shelembe that do we have Honorable Shelembe that do we have new do we have new solutions um, to prevent. Um, a high rate of illegal cross-border movement into our country. Um, not necessary solutions, but the effort is there and we are working hard and trying all sorts of um, uh, measures and interventions. As you are quite a, well aware, when you visited the deployment area, we indicated initiatives um, that are there in, uh, in place. And as we also get to technology in terms of uh, uh, um, physical uh, technology, as well as uh, the high-tech uh, technology that is coming in, then it will um, be a force multiplier to the soldiers. So the few soldiers that will be there will be able to gain more in terms of stopping and preventing and apprehending uh, the illegal cross-border movement uh, into the country. But uh, we must also take cognizance that the, the, the migration, illegal migration um, has to be addressed by uh, security, but the source um, uh, is not a security issue. So other interventions, um, whether economically or socially, uh, must play its role to reduce the appetite or intentions for uh, migrating uh, to RSA and doing that uh, illegally. So yes, it's a whole of government effort uh, that is uh, required. Uh, you raised the issue of uh, procurement, which affects um, uh, how we are able to respond to our work in terms of um, serviceability. 
um, it has not been resolved. It has not been changed because it is a structural issue. It is not a particular person or entity. It is the regime. The procurement regime um, is, is not flexible enough to respond to the requirement of the security environment, maybe particularly uh, the military, where when you are faced with a, a, a you, lose, you lose a tire and have to go and repair, you can do as quickly as required by the situation when you do not have uh, enough reserves. So the regime of procurement is still the same, and we are um, working through it. Um, and you ask also the issue of stopping and preventing misconduct. Uh, I have answered that when I was uh, addressing the other questions. I hope I've covered all that was um, uh, requested, uh, Chair and members of the committee. I submit. Uh, thank you very much, uh, General. Oh. <coughs> you, I think you have covered all the, the, the questions. Um, colleagues, um, Dennis Ryder, do you want to do a follow up? Yeah, please, Chair. Just, just the one thing. It, uh, it, it, it's not a, well, yeah. The one question that the general didn't cover was just about the dislodgement of the terrorist forces in Mozambique. Um, just are, are they being pushed into hiding uh, or are they being pushed further north into Tanzania and then Burundi? Because we've seen some flare ups there. Uh, I'm not sure if they're related. But obviously, if they're being just being pushed into hiding or, or, or fragmented, there is always that risk that they will be regrouping, uh, which will of course cause an extension of the uh, uh, of, of of the employment. So, ju just to give give us some kind of idea of what what's happening on the ground help will help us assess how long term this is going to be. And then, uh, General Sangweni, I'm looking forward to returning to Parliament. So we can we can see each other face to face again, um, and I think that it would be interesting for some of the members that haven't had uh, rat packs uh, to uh, instead of our normal snacks, I think we could uh, we could take a rat pack and we can we we, we can uh, we can let people see what the uh, what the food is like. It would be interesting for me to see how they've changed over the years as well. Thank you. Okay, uh, General. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, um, I will start uh, provisioning and preparing ration packs and maybe <laughs> provide you guys uh, with a three or four days ration packs without any other alternative. Um, uh, yes, uh, Honorable Ryder, the issue of um, the terrorists being dislodged and uh, where they are uh, running to, um, it has not been determined um, uh, currently and uh, because uh, to, to, to identify a terrorist against a normal person um, is, is not necessarily easy when they've started, when they've run away, ran away and um, entered into the community, they become normal and, and hide uh, amongst normal community members. Uh, uh, but indications in terms of intel indicated that they have run uh, still uh, inside Mozambique, um, uh, down south or north, and we, it cannot be indicated whether they've migrated to um, outside of um, uh, Mozambique. The aspect of, uh, yes, they might um, uh, scatter and, and hide and remain among the communities and then later on um, uh, uh, come back. It's, it's, it's always there. It's always a, a, a risk that is there when in terms of uh, illegal or informal armed uh, groupings. But, um, uh, the, the notion of uh, a traditional peacekeeping. Traditional peacekeeping, um, uh, it, 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 it do away with only a military solution. So the situation in the north of Mozambique, uh, it cannot be uh, finally resolved with a military uh, effort or military intervention. The government of Mozambique have started um, uh, to do uh, social uh, environment and economic uh, issues and community issues to normalize the situation as the government. Now, when, if and when possible, there's a national peacekeeping deployed, uh, all those uh, expertise 
uh, of politics and diplomacy, uh, social integration, um, uh, humanitarian affairs, economics, uh, get attended to by the mission and the uh, host um, uh, country. Uh, the government of Mozambique is indicating that they have plans, and 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 if you read more, you will hear about um, Cabo Delgado uh, reconstruction plan of four years, uh, maybe to bring Cabo Delgado to a situation where uh, the communities or local population will not embrace terrorism. Uh, also, in that they are attending to the uh, what. Uh, um, projects to deal with the radicalization uh, of the youth and the communities. So yes, there's um, a number of efforts that once the military effort is there to um, uh, deal with engaging directly and, and, and uh, but if, if the conditions in Capo Delgado holistically, then the terrorists will not find space uh, to be able to, to thrive. Uh, that is our belief, and that's what we believe that, uh, yes, it might require uh, military deployment still going further, but for the purpose of um, addressing terrorism in the region, uh, I think you will all uh, agree that it is necessary. As they migrate or seen now maybe possible in other countries, we get uh, worried, uh, countries of the, of the region. So, the whole uh, effort is required to stem it out in Mozambique and, and prevent its spreading. Uh, I submit, Chair. No, thank you very much, um, <clears throat> General. I think you, you've, you've covered all the, the issues. And um, colleagues, I, I think let's thank him um, <clears throat> for uh, his presentation and the manner in which uh, he dealt with uh, the, the questions. Uh, uh, I, I certainly value this uh, engagement <clears throat> uh, with, with him. First with your predecessor and, and now with you. Uh, <clears throat> quite informative. Uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it's accountability at its best. Uh, let's not drop it. Uh, if anything, let's raise it. But we are happy. I'm personally happy uh, with uh, <clears throat> the way you. I'm personally happy so far. All right, colleagues. Uh, <clears throat> let me, uh, in general, we, we can release you whilst we dispose of the the, the minutes, uh, colleagues. There is only one set. Uh, my one is one set of minutes. Uh, that we need to dispose of? Yes, Chair, it's one set of the 18th of November. Yes, let's do. Uh, let's dispose of uh, the minutes. Uh, please flight them. Uh, I will consider them as read. Uh, just scroll one page, second page, third page, and the last page, and we, we approve them. Right. Okay. All right. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so these are the minutes, colleagues, uh, of the 18th of November. Uh, this is the attendance record. Just scroll down. It was a briefing by the ombuds. 
and the discussion thereafter. And the consideration of the fourth term. Right, and these are the resolutions. Uh, the committee resolved that a letter should be sent to the minister to request the minister to instruct the Ombuds to investigate the situation of soldiers receiving rotten food in Mozambique in terms of section 611 of the military Ombuds. Uh, the committee resolved that the, the office uh, of the Ombuds should send the request, a request written a request uh, requested written responses within five days from the working day of the meeting. I think they've complied with that and we adjourned. Colleagues, uh, are there any corrections you may you may want to, uh, to effect? All right. And uh, can I get a move on? Yes, Chair. Yes, oh, Ellen, Ethan. Oh, yeah, thank you very yes. much, Chair. Yes. Uh, greetings, greetings to your good self and all members present in the meeting, Chair. I propose that we accept the minutes as true reflection. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nkosi, uh, for the uh, for proposing. Uh, any second? I second, Honorable Chair. Uh, thank you so much. Colleagues, thank you very much for your time. We are now at the end of the meeting. Uh, you may then reunite uh, yourselves with your families. Good night, Mutle. Thank Good night. you very Good much, Jefferson. Recording stopped. Thank you. Thank you.